All right. So let, let's get started from where we paused on Thursday. All right. So Thursday, we went through two specific documents, right? The first one was requirements document that you had read it. And then that we, we also, in the design document, we talked about the system architecture, right? It's in tier, which is a, nothing but a version of uh, multi-tier. Then we went through the system design document in terms of uh, what are the kind of information are presented into the system design specification. So what we're gonna start today is start talking about the software testing. So before we, we talked about going it from an analysis and the design phase into implementation phase, or there are certain tasks that quality assurance person focuses on the analysis phase and, and uh, enhances that during the design phase. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about it, right? So we'll start discussing with STLC and then we'll talk about a test plan document, which is the third document into your uh, folder. So the intention is to understand how the test plan document works. So let, let's talk about first a purpose or objectives of testing, right? So a lot of times people will say, hey, I'm running testing to make sure everything works. And I'll say the other way, you're running testing to find any uncovered bugs. That was the purpose you have it. It's not to pass it, but to make sure that the system doesn't show any bugs, right? And by not having any bugs, it essentially proves that system is working as expected, okay? Uh, also, the key aspect that during the testing that you focus on is, is the system fit for purpose? Okay. Just because it met all the requirements, that doesn't mean the system may be yet so able to work. Right? Think about it. You go to internet to search something and you put in criteria, it gives you a search results, but it takes 10 minutes to return the results. Is that fit for purpose? Most likely not, right? People won't like it that. So that is another purpose. And also like it's when we look at the functionality to make sure if the system behaves the way it is expected to do it. Okay. So when I look at it, like it's what are the good test cases, right? So execution of test cases is one thing, building the test cases is another aspect. And when you look into, Writing a test case, it's nothing but a situation that you're like, it's creating in the system to validate whether certain things works or not. When you look at it, like the good test case is the one which has the higher probability of finding the bug in the system. Okay. So, and when you execute it, and if you're actually able to find the test uh, error, that's essentially your successful test. As we go through it, there are other characteristics that we'll look into writing the test cases, right? Such as you don't want to write the test cases which is too simple. At the same time, you don't want to write one that's too complex and tries to test a lot of functionality at the same time, okay? So you need to think about a good balance. And a lot of times that balance comes at, with the experience as you write it more. As a quality assurance person, when you put the software tester hat on, right, your goal is to find as many errors as possible. But it also, we want to focus on its finding as early as possible. The intention is, as I talked about when we were talking about building the house last time, right? The sooner that you find the error, the less expensive it is to um, fix the error, okay? Uh, the other aspects, it also enables you to see it, what is the behavior or the weak points within the system, so, okay? So let's talk about the software test cycle. Okay. So, we looked at the software development life cycle that you started from the planning phase and analysis phase. 
the key thing when you look into software testing, right? That is a parallelism to the whole development lifecycle. That's why when we talk about it as a software tester's journey, doesn't start only in the testing phase. It starts early in the life cycle itself. And that's why you're embedded in the quality aspect. So the first thing, when you're trying to like it's test something, you need to look into is understanding the requirement. Okay, so that's the first thing that happens. In, and that's what you, we started with it. So if you notice it, like it's, we ask all of you to read that document. So we started with the identifying the requirements. The second aspect that we're going to start looking at is if I know that requirement, what it means it, for a system to put, fulfill that requirement. Okay. A lot of times you will hear a word called acceptance criteria. At what point, if this is the requirement, what are criteria that I will use it or yardstick I'll use it to validate that the system meets that requirement, right? So acceptance criteria. And as we go through it, we'll look into all those acceptance conditions. Once I have a good understanding of what needs to be tested, what it means to pass it, then you're going to so go into planning and the designing aspect. So then how would I go about it? Right. So think about it. Right? So this is where you want to go. This is your goal as a tester. What strategy are you going to use it that enables you to reach to that point? Okay. So you will start pl uh, planning and execution around the designing aspects of it. What that means is you will identify all the different test scenarios. You will start writing it the step-by-step -step instruction of how you're going to go about, go about doing it. So think about it like if I'm like it's building a house and I want to validate that the electrical systems are essentially wired properly in the house, right? So what would I do? I'll start writing, hey, I'm going to go into every plug I'm going to put it a tester to make sure there is a live electricity going on. I'll go to the switch. I'll turn on the switch to make sure it turns on and off as expected all of the fixtures that are connected to that particular switch. Right. So I'll start writing at those kind of designs and I'll identify how many places I need to do it, how many switches, right? Because um, turning on a AC unit it's probably a little bit different testing condition than just turning it on a light bulb. Right? So you will do all of those. Then at that point, you will wait for the development team to actually give you a working software. Once they give you a working software, what are you gonna do it is all of the plan that you do it, you go to and execute against that working software. And as you work through it, probably you're gonna find some errors. Something is going to work as expected. Potentially, something is going to be breaking and not working as expected, right? It pulls, doesn't pull the legs. Right so you're essentially going to let the developers know that, hey, this thing doesn't work. Right? That process is called the defect tracking, right? identifying defect and tracking it. So they will do that. You go back and forth till you meet all of the acceptance criteria. At that point, you will go ahead and like it's going to review it and audit. Did I look through all of the requirements, all of the test cases that I've identified? Are they all in an acceptance space or they passed it? Right. Think of it, right? If you go into the house and you say it's electrical system needs to work, all of the plugs work fine, all of the switches work fine for light stuff, but none of the AC unit or heater unit works. Right? You're not going to accept. Them. You're going to say it's hey, the electrical system is not working as expected. Maybe you didn't connect those uh, devices properly. All right. So once you finish it, all those validations, I think, then you go ahead and review it. And at that point, you just say, hey, is this system ready and fit for the purpose? If it is, then you're going to turn the user and say, okay, the system is ready for you to do your testing. Right. So most of the times, right, when you finish building the house, you just don't move in, right? There are also one final inspection which is the user or owner does it to make sure everything works as expected, everything is built according to design specification, and then only they write the checks or cut that. So at that point, they will essentially accept it, and that becomes your baseline of the software. 
Okay, then any times any enhancement comes, you start back in that life cycle. Okay. Any questions? There is another model that you will a lot of times encounter in the software testing world. Okay, and that's called a B model. Something similar, right? But it, this one goes in from the viewpoint of a development team. So the first one that we talked about is similar from the user point of view. But if I have to look at it, how the tester is working with me as a developer's point of view, that's where this model comes in. Okay, so think about it, right? The first thing happens is user gets your requirement. You got the requirement specification document. Okay. At that point, the only detail I have it is around the users, right? So I'll start laying it out. Hey, if I'm a user, and if I have to test this requirement, what tests I would run? Okay, so you build it something known as a user acceptance test. Okay. And we'll talk about the different types of tests as we go through it a little bit later today. But you start building it out. If I had to test that user requirements, how would I go about it? Then the next thing happens is, the development team takes that user requirement and starts breaking it into the various functional specifications. Okay. So if you think about it, like when you were looking through the system design document, there was a functional decomposing diagram, right? Which says that, hey, I'm gonna build a security manager, I'm gonna build a user manager, I'm gonna build a report manager. That's nothing but taking the requirements and breaking it down into different functional units. So they are going to like it's break it down. If you take a look at each one of the functional units that they are going to plan to break it down, and you build something, what is called as a system test around it. it says how I'm going to test each one of those functions. Okay. And how those functions are going to interact with each other. So, so this the is, next step is the development. So this is the development activity as they go through it. This is what you do it as a quality assurance person to help you to match that as they go through that development life cycle. Okay. So I started building it those system tests. So it's how remember we talked about software architecture is all the different components when you plug it together. What is the relationship? What are the boundary conditions? You start identifying tests to do those. Then you essentially take it and this is, hey, I have a security manager. I need to further drill it down and start building what I know as technical specification, how that particular security manager is going to get implemented. Right. So I take the functional specification, which is now five different components. I take one component, start breaking in on detail around how I'm going to implement that as a developer. So then at that point, I'm going to start preparing it, the tests. Okay. So it's, if I take those individual capabilities within the security managers, how I'm going to test about it. Okay. So that's a lot of times it's known as a link test. Okay. I'll give one example as we go through it. Just hang on until we talk about this answer. So I take that link test. Okay. At that point, the next step for the developer is going to take that technical specification and then just go ahead and break it down into specific small programs or small modules. And then you essentially say, if I have to test that one small thing, how I'm going to do that? So they build a unit test cases. Okay. And, and then the developer starts actually implementing. So they are breaking it down into design and then start writing it. So think about it, if you're solving a puzzle, can everybody play with the puzzle, right? So let's say if I have a thousand piece puzzle, okay, where do I start? Looking at the pictures, what will it look like when the puzzle is finished, right? So that's nothing but my requirement, right? 
a visual test, if I just say it's A, all I'm going to do is compare this picture with the things that I created. Okay. What are you going to do next? You're going to say, okay, it's fine. There are like it's multiple pieces and parts in this picture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build my strategy. It says, I'm going to take, break this entire puzzle. It's thousand pieces, right? I'm not going to try to connect all thousand together. I'm going to try to like connect this corner first. Then I'm going to connect this portion. I'm going to connect this portion, right? So I break it down that puzzle into different pieces, right? I haven't completed or I haven't built anything, right? But mentally, I start mapping into, I'm going to break it into the different pieces. Then I say, it's, okay, for each piece, what it will look like, right? So I drill it down in that one particular piece is how the components within that piece is going to be. Let's say if it's a tree, right? Then you can say it's how the different aspects of the tree is going to be. I'm going to build this, I like take out the stems, take out the roots, make sure the roots are falling in the bottom part, the tree is put in and then the leaf comes in. Okay. That's essentially breaking it the technical specification. Mm -hmm. Then I said, oh, once I know that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find all the pieces which form the root, lay it next to each other, because I know they are going to be forming and closing it together with each other to build that particular part of the piece. Then I go ahead and say, okay, now I'm going to start building my puzzle. I'm going to start connecting those pieces. Okay. From a big folder, you start keep breaking it down. And as you break it down, you're like, it's kind of identifying what type of test you're gonna run it at that particular level to validate that that small piece that you kind of broke it down is working as expected, okay? So this is the design part. This is the implementation. I start now coding. Started connecting my pieces of the puzzle. Right. Once I have it, then it becomes an execution arm. So think of this, this is a planning arm. This is the execution arm. This is, is what test I'm gonna run it in order to execute it, okay? So all the tests that I did it when I connect the pieces, I'm gonna make sure, does this piece fit next to this other piece that I was planning to do? Yes, it's good, it's a unit test. Each individual piece is working as expected and connected. Then I go ahead and say, okay, now that a small tree is working, I need to start building it, connecting it with the other piece. Then I'm gonna bring all the pieces together to make sure everything works as expected. And then finally, I'm gonna look at my puzzle picture and the puzzle that I made it and make sure they both aligned it. They are one and same. Right. So once I code it, I'm going to start testing that small pieces. Once all of the small pieces are done, uh, I'm going to bring it all together into a module, which was like it's kind of technical specification component. So and the beginning test is the module test. Individual module test, yes. Is my module working as expected? Because I have small pieces in that. Are those connected and working perfectly? Then system test is, are all the modules working together? Like the whole system. The whole system, each of the individual components, right? So I've, this starts a component test. This one is when I put the components together, does it work as expected as a system, right? And then this one is, is my users also agree that my system works. So the middle is what kind of test you're going to run it to execute that. So think about it, right? My user requirements, I'll build the user acceptance testing and I'm going to execute those. That's the layer, right? So each one of this is a layer if you think about it, progression that as I go through. Okay. Any questions? So is this the very popular model, the B model? Is this the one I mean, in mostly you? So think about it. When you talk about the B model, it's a mindset. This is the approach that you need to use it in order to test any system. Just think about, right? I mentioned, right, to all of you that like some kind of a much more of a science fan. So if you think about it, right, tomorrow, uh, the NASA is gonna launch 
the mission back to the moon, right? It's a big rocket. You don't just put the big rocket the first time on the uh, tower and then light up a fuse on it to see if everything is working or not, right? You actually build all those components first, make sure each one of those components are working it, and you bring it together, right? So all they're doing it is tomorrow when they launch it, they're doing a system test. As all the pieces work together as a one system. Right? They've tested each one of the components that works as expected, but they've never fired that rocket. So tomorrow they will fire it up and they will see it, whether it works as a single system or not, right? And the acceptance test is essentially when they bring it that particular, uh, the, um, the unit, which is kind of riding on top of it, like it's going to carry, right now it's going to carry the dummies. But when they bring it, those things back and splash it in the Pacific Ocean, that's where the acceptance test is going to finish. Did everything work as expected? Yes. Uh, during the design time, uh, I see that there are two arrows which is going towards the list. Why, why is it like that? When you say it's like you're taking this, that and is, this one? Yeah, there's two arrows going towards one is to uh, user acceptance test, and another one is the system. Oh, test. no, well, all you just say is that with this, I designed this. Then, and with this testing, uh -huh. I did this. Once I know what the user acceptance testing is, uh, I need to rely on functional breakdown before I can write it, right? So I need to have this knowledge after this in order to write this thing. And this, in order to write this thing, I need to have this and this knowledge. Okay. There are dependencies. You have questions? Yeah, my question was about the, you look at this is in around the, uh, they have a, the Europa and the, uh, the Dana. So as a test tool, so do you have to do a test tool or requirement and to test it at the same time? So think of it, right? So this part is how the progression on the design aspect progresses. Remember we said that you start with the analysis phase. When you look at the STLC, right? You start with the analysis phase. What did you do? You started looking at the requirements and did 3 C and T, right? So when you start doing that, you can start saying, remember I said, is this testable? Is this complete, right? So you start understanding, is it testable or not? But it's not sufficient, right? Then you have to still write the test, how I'm gonna test about it, right? So that's the activity you're doing. While you're doing that, the developer is taking that requirement and says, how I'm gonna break it down to build a system, right? So that's what the developer view. But you are closely watching the developers is how you're going to break down the system because I now need to know what are the different components, what are the boundary conditions, right? So most of the time, so when you see it, right, even when you look at the four by four relay, right? So the runners are running it in a four by four relay, right? What is the most chances for them to break down? Not when individual runner is running, right? They could still have a problem while I'm running a lap, but the biggest problem happens if you look at it, all those uh, races is when you pass the baton, right? A lot of times people either don't pass it on time or drop it, or they slow it down in order to pass the baton, right? That's where the problem comes in. Same thing in the system. When you're a boundary, when you're doing some sort of handoff, that's where the problem comes in. So you need to know what are those handoffs or boundaries gonna happen so you can make sure that I'm writing a test cases to say, are those handoffs happening properly or not? Okay, so think about it is as the developers progress it, you're keeping up with them in the design aspect to build your strategy and plan. So if I go in here, right, in order to do this, you need to keep up with how the developers are building their system. Right, because you can't wait till everything is done to then start testing. Right, think about what can you do it in parallel as you're going through it. Right. Also, at the same time, remember what I said: the sooner you identify the problem, the better it is. Right, the less expensive it is to fix them. So when I think about it, right, they're breaking it down in functions. 
you can start looking at it and says, remember one of the things we talked about, the requirement traceability. You're also going to look at it and says, hmm, you talked about building this five functional units to do this functionality. But there is a big piece of functionality that you're not going to test it. That's identified in the requirement phase. So you're going to push back them and say, is their design complete? Or have their design is going to essentially map it to the requirement so that you can write those edge test cases and module test cases to fulfill the system requirement. Okay, so it's a connected pieces as they go through it. Right? They are not building things in vacuum. And all of them, they work in groups or? Yeah, so typically when you look in the agile world, they're all just sitting together. They are not, hey, one person is sitting there, one person is sitting there. Now again, right, when they say sitting together, and then nowadays it's more virtually they're sitting together. You may have somebody who performing a development function miles away from you, but you're working together through the digital platform. Like, the intention is they are working together from the timeline scale as they are going through. Okay, any questions? Yes. ELCLC stands for software testing lifecycle. Yes. What's the SDL? Software development lifecycle. Okay. Remember the picture I drew it last time? Go there. So that, that's the order, that's the overall lifecycle for the software, which is specific to the sector. So, uh, yes. So think about it. This is the development lifecycle. How am I going to build that? So if you're building a house, right? What is my house building life cycle looks like? Testing life cycle is what is the life cycle looks like for all those inspectors who's gonna inspect whether the house is built according to specification or not. What is the life cycle they're gonna go through? That's what that would mean. Okay. For you, it's an important to understand both because you are influencing quality assurance in the development life cycle. Same time, you're building it all of your test scenarios to essentially help you to embed those qualities into the system and also validate is the system works as it's great. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions online? All right. So let's talk about the test point. So, I gave you kind of an overview of what is the structure needs to be in the test life cycle, right? Think about it, right? So, if, if I'm a our firm owner, right, and I'm asking people to build a system for me, right, I'm going to give them a requirement. And then, the next question I'm going to ask them is how long it's going to take you to build it? So there are two aspects of it. One is building it. The other one is validating and verifying it. It is building, built properly, right? So one is the development aspect. One is the testing aspect. They both need to be. So you saw it in the requirements to design document and transition, right? So you had a requirements. The developer goes and builds a design document, which essentially maps it. This is how I'm going to build it. And based on that, they will give an estimate. This is how long it's going to take me to build. You need to do the same thing for testing, right? You need to have a plan. How are you going to test the system? Okay, and how long it's going to take it? What's this going to cost you? And then you need to put both of that development cost and the design um, testing cost together and says, this is how long it's going to take me from a time-wise, and this is how long it's going to cost, or how much it's going to cost me. Okay, so the second part of it is how I'm going to test the system and how long it's going to take me. That aspect is kind of drafted out in the test plan. Okay. Typically, the test plan is built by the lead tester or lead software engine. Uh, lead software quality engineer. Okay. If you're working in a big system, right, where there are many testers or many quality assurance engineers are working together, 
where is the lead will write that. And then you will contribute by providing some input into it. If you're working in a systems or an environment, you are the only quality assurance engineer, you will be writing. Mm -hmm. The good part is it's typically most of the companies have a template. It says, okay, you take that template, plug in the details, and then reduce. Then do it. Okay. But at the high level, what is this plan contains, right? It talks about what are the testing tasks I'm going to carry, right? So everything that I need to do, it will be in there. It will also identify what skills I will need it in order to execute those tasks, okay? What tools I will need. What are the timeline to finish each one of the tasks? Roughly timeline, it's proposed timelines, okay? And the whole purpose of when I build that document is how I'm going to validate that the system works as expected. Okay. So going back to this one, like the acceptance criteria, what it will take it me to accept the software system, that it is working as expected. That's what it's kind of laid out at a high level. Okay. So what does it contain, right? It, just like it's any things, right? Any work that you do, at first thing you identify, what is the scope of the work? Right. What will be included and what won't be included? That's called the scope discussion. Then you will also talk about the people and schedule, right? So the resources, how many people I need, what kind of tools I will need it in order to execute it. Then you talk about the schedule, how long it's going to take it. And then there is another aspect that you need to talk about how I'm going to go do the work. So what is going to be my approach? Then in addition to that, some of the supporting thing it does it is what are my test item, right? So the resource and approach. I'm going to utilize those things to work together to go around testing. What all feature I'll test it goes back to the scope. What is in scope, what is not in scope, okay? Testing and allocation, right? So that goes back to schedule. And then I will also have a risk aspect, okay? So what if things doesn't come out in the time that I expected? So what are my risks, right? So when you look at it, in order for me to write the technical specification and um, test, right? I'm dependent on designer to finish that work. In order to write the unit test, the designer is gonna be dependent on the specific program details. So there's gonna be dependency and then they're gonna implement till the software is available. I can't test any of this. Thing. I may have designed everything ready, but I can't execute any one of that. What happens if any one of those things gets delayed? What is the impact on the project, right? So a lot of those things comes out as a risk contingency. Mm -hmm. like what if the environment changes? What if the platform is not available? Like we talked about, hey, I'm going to do it in Azure. Well, what if the system is down and I can't do my testing? So those aspects needs to be laid out in the test plan in terms of risk mitigation. We also talked about the tool. Okay? But then it also lays out, well, what are you going to get as a deliverable out from me as part of the test plan? <clears throat> so that's what it lays out. Okay. A lot of times that focuses on the metrics as well as the scripts. From the metrics point of view is that it enables me to track the progress. Am I on target to meet that goal? whatever schedule, timeline, and the resources that you identified it, right? So a lot of metrics gives you an insight about the progress, okay? It also gives you an insight about the quality of the product that it is getting produced. Okay. Yes? My question is that we got our abandoned to the list. Uh, 
And then you bend the middle of the idea of the And then you, you, you mix the things. Or you, can, you, you mix the hair of the middle. Mm -hmm. What is that? You can go back to the middle part. Okay, then. It depends on what kind of thing that I want to do. Right. So if, if it is in a bug within the software, then I'll go back to the developer to fix it. But if it is uh, an environment related issue, Probably I won't go to the developer, but I'll go over to somebody who is responsible to manage that environment and says, hey, this environment is not. So it all depends on what the error is, right? Or what kind of issue I run into. Okay. So, so it all depends not, on the risk that I ran into. So it's not always there is a different that go to the developer. It's not like that. So you still have to think about, right? If there is a defect, you go to developer, but developer said, hey, it's going to take me like five months to fix this. Right? You already had identified the timeline. The project manager then need to address that risk. And you as a tester need to adjust your plan to address that risk also. Right? So if you look at it, right, the original, and I go back to the example, like this, that people can relate it, is um, the rocket that's going to be launched tomorrow, the Artemis, originally was supposed to be launched in May, right? They had a problem with the filling. One day started running the wet test to fill the liquid propellant. They had an issue, identified a problem in there. That needed to fix. They couldn't fix it. They tried to fix it while it was on the launch pad. They couldn't. And they said, hey, we need to stop fueling. We need to go back and deal with this leakage of the valve because it was not working as expected, shutting it down. So they needed like three months to build it, validate and test it before they can ready for their wet test again. Well, that impacted my launch timeline. That also impacted me ability to fill all the fuel and rerun the test, right? As a tester, I'm responsible to run that test, but I couldn't run the test till that issue is fixed, right? So the risk mitigation is that, hey, we need to shift the launch timeline, right? That means I need to now put additional resources that originally I was planning to utilize in May in the month of July to retest that thing. And then you can do that, right? So that's a risk mitigation. It's not always, hey, the people who build the wall has to fix it. Yeah, they have to fix it. But the risk is bigger than that because now that timeline or that proposal to fix that essentially impacts the whole bunch of things. So same thing will happen in a software world, right? You try to like it's fix it. Well, that capability was not available in that environment. I wrote it, but the database was not available. Well, I need to wait till that database becomes unavailable before I can like it's upload all of my data and then give you for testing. Right. So there, some, there will be those kind of dependencies. Right. So some may be specific to development, some may be specific to the project management aspect of it. But you still have to deal with those dependencies. So it depends on what type of bug is that? What type of bug or what kind of issue? Right. So when I talk about the risk, not necessarily all the bugs are the only one which requires continuity planning. Sometimes the resource availability also requires you to continue planning. Yeah. Right. That's the biggest problem. So you have to look at it from all those aspects. What all will derail my plan is what you're looking at it and how I'm going to address that issue that is impacting my plan. Yeah. Any questions so far? All right. So in addition to all of those, it also talks about what are the templates and the guidelines, I'm going to use it in order to build it, all of the artifacts. Okay. In addition to this, the test plan contains something known as test scenarios and test cases. Okay. So think around case. So whenever you try to utilize the system, right, you're not purely utilizing based on a requirement, right? You're thinking it from business process point of view also, right? So when we're looking at the requirements, right? There are two aspects, a functional requirement, 
but there was a mapping of that functional requirement into business processes, right? So one of them was managing the dealerships. You recall it into a requirement stuff, right? That's a bigger concept of how I'm gonna manage the dealerships, right? Well, there may be a different things that I do it within that energy, right? I might, I'm gonna create a dealer. I'm gonna update a dealer, right? Those are my high level scenarios. Within that creation, right? I can look at it all the different ways that I'm gonna create it. You guys with me so far? I'm gonna create a dealer. I'm gonna, like it's the way I'm gonna create it is I'm gonna create two dealers in Ohio. I'm gonna create one dealer in Indiana so that it enables me to test all the different conditions of it, right? A, does it generate a unique franchise number? Because they are both are in the same county in the same state. Because remember, the unique franchise number was a combination of state, county, and the number. I need to test it both, right? I need to test it that what if there are multiple dealers in the same county? Is it generating unique number? Or what are, if I'm across the state boundaries, then does it generate the proper? Right, so those are my test cases on the scenario of creating a dealer. Okay, so the test cases will have a situation. My situation is I'm trying to create a dealer. What are the different conditions under which that dealer is gonna be created? That's my test cases, right? So there's a one too many relationship. And then I will also talk about what are the detailed step-by-step -step instructions I needed in order to create a dealer, let's say in Ohio. Okay. So those, those are nothing but the test scripts. So your test plan contains that three levels of details that you need to execute for the designing. Okay. You may just say, hey, I'm gonna write it 50 test cases with five different scenarios. Right. But you're to lay it out that. And then when you're in the designing phase, you will start rolling it down the detail and specifics of each one. That means, sir, we are breaking the scenario into test cases. Yes. Okay. And then as you go through it, right, your test plan will talk about two different types of metrics. One is the product metrics and one is process metrics. So when you think around the quality of the product, then those all are product metrics. In other words, hey, how many test cases are passed? How many test cases are still open with finding the bugs, right? So if for every five test cases that I'm executing, if I'm finding bugs in two of them, right, that's a product metric. Process metrics is around how many test cases I'm running on a daily basis. How many test cases I'm planning to run total? And am I on the track to meet the timeline, right? So it's around the process aspect of it, not necessarily product aspect. You need both those metrics to understand the quality and the timeliness of the day able to deliver your product. Okay. Uh -huh. Can you speak a little bit louder? I think it's going to be part of the language. If it's a little bit louder, I think it's going to be part of the language. And they will have a metal action in Vienna. So that is a scenario for that. Those are test cases. Now, scenarios I'm creating a dealer. Right? So that's a higher level concept. But in order to create a dealer, there are five different ways of conditions that occur and for each condition of our make sure that under that condition, it's still good. So, so what does a typical test case contain? All right, so you talk about the scenario, the scenario is broke down into the different conditions. So anytime you're trying to write a test case, it essentially tells you, what are my inputs? What is my expected output? So what is going to be expected behavior? And what are the sets of execution conditions? So if you think about, I want to add two numbers and I calculate. 
what will be my input, right? The two numbers plus an operator, which is a plus sign. It says, that is what I'm gonna give you an input. My output I'm expecting is you adding those two numbers and then give me that. Now, the, the number that I get it, right? It's gonna be depending on the condition, whether I started a fresh addition, then it will be, or if I was doing a running addition. Right, so I will be doing two plus two plus two plus two plus. Then as I go through it, what is that, right? So that's a execution condition versus if I'm just doing a two plus two. Like what is the scenario under which this particular thing is happening? And what is expected behavior? What is the output results I'm expecting? And sometimes it could be an error, right? So if I'm doing it, I calculate, right? So addition is easy. But what if I'm doing a division and I try to divide by zero? At that point, my input is still two numbers and operators. But my expected behavior is I should error it out and say you can't divide with me. Right. So instead of getting a number, I'll probably get some sort of an exception or fault having that thing. So those are the kind of things your test case contains. Okay. And what, when you go back, it says, what are the good test cases? Right? Things we already talked about, right? It should have a high probability of finding defect. But there are two other characteristics that you really need to think about the test cases. It produces an unambiguous, tangible result. Okay. So if you recall, right? Remember I said, you need to do a 3C in the test condition for every requirement, right? So what is testable means? I should be able to, with the confidence says, did it give me an answer, yes or no? If this was my expected behavior, did I see exactly same behavior, yes or no, right? But if you said, eh, part of it, it did, other part it didn't, right? What is it? It's a yes or no? I don't know, right? That's an ambiguous result. So any ambiguity, that you put it, you can't say that, hey, did it work or didn't work, right? You can't just say, hey, when it rains, you can't launch the rocket, but you can rocket and only this and that. So if I'm asking you, do you launch the rocket or not? That doesn't help me to understand whether you launched it or not, right? You can say, hey, I launched it because there was no rain. I know exactly what happened, right? So that's the aspect that every test case needs to have it. They need to produce an unambiguous result, specific, crisp answer, okay? And another characteristic, it needs to be repeatable and predictable. Okay. So going back to the calculator example, right? So if I say two plus two, it turns me four. If I execute the same thing 10 times, I'm expecting every time it'll give me answer four. I, if you say it, sometimes it'll give you three, sometimes it'll give you four, sometimes it gives you eight, that's not predictable. I'm giving the same input, same condition, but the software is giving me a completely different answer every time, so it's not predictable. So your, your test cases needs to be the same way. If I run the same test cases over and over again, I should expect the same behavior. Now it's a different thing if there is a different conditions around it, right? But is it predictable every time it gives the same answer? Right. So let's take an example of uh, the switch that we talked about, right? So if I'm testing in an electrical system, right? Every time I flip the switch, it needs to turn on the light. That's the test. But if I flip the switch, sometimes it turns on the light. And if the light is on, it'll turn it off. Well, those are two different things, right? Because now there is a condition. If it is on, so it's a toggle switch. It's not on off switch, right? 
So I would test the toggle switch differently than what I would test the normal on-off switch. Everybody with me, right? Those are two things. But irrespective of what type of switch it is, if it's on-off switch, every time I flip it, all it should do is on, right? It should be predictable and it should be repeatable that every time I flip it, it's gonna be on. If I run it 10 times, that scenario, every time it should just turn it on. If it's a toggle switch, the predictability for that toggle switch, it's every time I switch it, it's gonna go from one condition to another condition. That's it, right? If it was on, it'll turn off. If it was off, it'll turn it on. Still repeatable and predictable, right? So you need to make sure a good test case is repeatable and predictable. Yes. Question. Like, like, as you said, the it should be like same result every time if it is expected. As long as the conditions, the state of the system is same, the inputs are same, we should expect the same result. Okay. What in that case? Basically, uh, just in case, suppose I find some bug or error or something. So I said, I told like the developer, hey, uh, this is our problem, so we have to fix it. But previous behavior was same, basically, like, like I, I was testing something and everything was fine, but at some point I feel like, hey, here is a like problem. So developer changed something. So do you think he changed something? Like yeah. everything like will be same or I have to test everything? Again. You have to test it again. Because mm -hmm. uh, you don't know while fixing that, did they break something else mm -hmm. or not? Right? Maybe that changes can happen to other things. Mm -hmm. so, so think of this way, right? I said, hey, there was a problem in wiring. Okay, the electrician comes and fixes that wiring. You need to know that they didn't trip off anything else. Yeah. Right? Everything else still works and he actually fixed the problem that's supposed to fix it and then break it something else while fixing that. So every time whenever we found anything, so everything. Yes, that's why it's a full-time job. Okay. Um, right. Think of it. Right. So the test going tomorrow for the rocket. So, so keep it signed. Right. If if I fix that valve while fixing that valve, then I need to make sure they didn't break any of the ceiling ring that goes around the valve that causes the leakage. Right. I have to run those tests again. I can't just rely on, hey, you fixed it well, therefore everything else was fine. No, that changed the condition of the system. You need to make sure the system is still behaving the way it is expected. Just one more question. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the same example. Just in case, at the end, before just before launch the rocket, I found something like it is big. So it is all like, those things blame me only like why you are finding this now or people can get fired for that yeah, yeah. Lose job. yeah. okay yeah. right so, I, i'll tell you an example and that will put the things in perspective okay. if i'm a patient i'm getting operated by a doctor on a surgery table okay doctor finishes all of that and they find it up. instead of a right leg and operate it on the left leg. <laughs> right? So it's, ah, it's okay. Just we'll do another surgery on the right leg. Is that going to be acceptable to you? No. Why would it be acceptable to the people who are paying it for the software? Okay. That, that part I understand. But the question is just in case, if it is not me, I'm testing right thing and something happened like YouTube changes, continuous changes. And because of that changes, something like big come at that point, like, hey, uh, this is like, I don't know what's going on. It's like not working properly before it was. So in that case, 
how can it work? Basically, they will blame me. Uh, Again, I, I would. It's a culture thing. Okay. Depending on the company where you are, if there is a blame culture in that company, yeah. they're going to find somebody who is responsible for that damage. Right. And you will pay the consequences. If it is a more of a mindset, let's learn it, figure out what went wrong and make sure next time it doesn't happen. That's a different culture. Okay. So I would not focus on, hey, whether I'm gonna get fired or not. I would just focus on always, am I doing the right thing or not? That's the only thing you can control. Now, if you see a pattern of that happening, Right. Every time you are trying to go to production, and you are keep finding bugs. Then the blame thing will come. That right. will be fine. <laughs> or, or let's say you are getting the software, you are giving to the user. Can we have one conversation? Uh, without, uh, <clears throat> without doing your job as a QA, then and every time whenever there's a change. You are keep handing the software to the user for testing, and they keep finding more and more things, not fixing the, something is broken and all those things. Definitely, you are responsible as a QA to make sure before it goes for user testing, make sure everything is fixed properly. You do the regression testing, which we will talk about shortly. It's your responsibility as a QA to make sure nothing is broken. Think about this. If that rocket, it's kind of launched out and you didn't do a good job of doing the right thing of testing everything, you just said, hey, you fixed it. Let me just focus on testing only this piece, but don't do the whole regression testing. And then the rocket fails. Think about the consequences. It's not just a cough, right? If the rocket falls into populated area, people lose their lives. Who's responsible for it? Right? So that's what you need to think about. Have you seen the movie Apollo 13? Right? Things fell on the way to the moon because somebody didn't do our ring testing after the frost conditions. And that's when it failed. And that's why they had to work through 72 hours to get those astronauts back alive. On that. So you should look at that movie that has a lot of relationship to what is testing, what it means by stress testing, what it means by essentially loading performance testing. And so on. Okay. <coughs> the standards. Okay. This is the reality, right? That's why it's called computer science. Okay. So the difference between science and engineering is engineering you have set standards. You will always have precision involved into it. Science is all about experiments, okay? Software development is all about experiments, okay? You're not gonna find two softwares exactly the same from one to another one. Each is gonna have a uniquely different, just like every human is different, right? There is a guideline, hey, if you have a headache, you take this pill, I'll help you to relieve it. Does it mean it works for everybody? Probably not. Right? That's why what we call it is most of the, in the software world, you have focuses around processes and documentation and guidelines. Not necessarily the exact same standard. Now, there are some IEEE standards which focuses on how you go about doing it, but not necessarily, hey, you must do this, this, and this for this software, and therefore it will work, right? Every software is a little unique. That's why you're not gonna find an industry-wide standard. Now, within a company, they may have instituted a standard that everything that we do it will do this, this, and this activity for sure. That's a individual company level standard, but you're not gonna find something that goes across, and it's rightfully so, right? So if I'm writing a tech software versus writing a software to launch a rocket versus somebody's writing a software to automate the self-driving, all three are gonna have different characteristics. You can't say I'm gonna do the same testing for each one of them. Okay. 
Any questions so far? All right. Another aspect that you typically define into the test plan is the environment. Okay. So when you look at the broad categorization, okay, every system it's typically falls into one of the three environments at any given point. Okay. So it, when a developer starts building it, right? It's probably not the most stable system at that point. Right? Things change regularly. And I'm a developer, I'm writing this software. Right? I found it's not working as expected. I need to go back, fix it, this logic. I'm going to continue to do that. So I'm going to continuously do different things till I'm satisfied that things work as expected right? before moving it to giving it to the testing. Right? As a tester, you don't want something that is constantly changing. Why? Because every time something changes, if you have to do the regressive testing, if things are constantly changing, then I cannot complete my work. I'm constantly redoing the same thing over and over again, which doesn't add a value to the business usage. Right? So I want a somewhat stable environment. And I want some sort of cadence that, hey, I'm, you're going to fix that software and you give me every so often. So if I find 10 bugs, you're not giving me fixing one bug and giving me fixing one bug and then giving me. You maybe just says, hey, I'm going to give you another version tomorrow and it's going to fix this five bucks. Right? So that gives you some stability that, hey, I'm not doing the regression testing over and over again and I'm focusing on producing it, the timeline to the right place so that I go. Versus the environment, once it goes into production, you want it to be stable. You want it, things to work as expected. Okay. Each environment, it's going to have a different criteria in terms of expectation. Okay. So think about a puzzle that you were talking about, right? Earlier, I want to try to build a puzzle. Right? We say that I'm going to break it into different pieces, right? And, and if I take one piece, let's say talk about the tree, let's say I pick up the tree, right? You look at the behavior, right? That, hey, I try to fit two pieces together. It may may not fit, right? If it doesn't fit, I'm going to take off the one piece, I'm going to change it with another piece and try to fit it together, right? Can you say at that point that the puzzle is it? ready to integrate the tree with something else? Probably not, right? Because it's constantly changing it. I'm, once I build the tree, let's say if I'm doing, building that thousand piece puzzle with my two daughters, right? And each one of us is taking a piece, right? We're not gonna go in and say, hey, it's ready to integrate with the other piece till I get my own portion of the puzzle working fine, right? So, the, at that point, I will be constantly changing it. And my daughter will of no use if I give it to her one piece at a time, because then she's trying to like rebuild it every time to see if that piece is going to work with the pieces that she has at the time. Right? Same mindset with the developer. They're constantly doing it. You may have multiple developers building multiple components. They are not ready to bring it together. Right? So they're going to focus on working in this. Once they are confident that, hey, my part of the puzzle is working fine, then I can say it's now it's ready to integrate, right? So as a tester, right, she gets it two pieces, one from me, one from the other dog. She tries to bring that together. She finds it, yeah, even though the tree looks okay, it doesn't fit with the house right away. There are some pieces that needs to be added into in between in order to work that, right? She will give back and says, okay, you need to expand the tree to cover some of the other edge portions that was missing, right? I fix that and give it back. Same concept, a developer is building the piece. They test it, hey, as a tree, it's working fine. Give you to test it, to integrate it. You're gonna test it and say, does this tree look good? Yeah, let me integrate with the other, works? Yeah, it's good. 
If it doesn't work, I'm going to say, hey, this piece doesn't connect properly. So you need to change that. So they change that, give it back. They will redo the same effort. First thing they will do it is they will try to fit it. Is it working? Then they will look at it. Is every other piece was still the same way that it was before? Because if it's not, then, hey, you changed to fit this piece, but now it's not going to fit the other piece because you moved that piece away from where it was working fine before. Same way, different modules, software tester brings those modules working together, great. If not, one module, whatever was not working, they tell it, the developer goes and fixes it, but they have another dependency on the third module. Now it's no longer working, right? So that's why they need to do regression testing. Now within here, you have different test environments depending on the complexity of the software, okay? Obviously, we talked about the system test, right? We talked about the link test, which is nothing but an integration test, right? So the link test environment is a little bit different than pieces, bring pieces together. I can't, while I'm trying to like it's do a testing of the different components within the module, I can just give it a module for somebody else to fit, essentially connect and test it with something else, right? So, If you look at it, right, this diagram, right? If I'm in the middle of doing this test, right here, I'm not sure if everything is gonna work it fine here or not, right? Because things are still changing here. Are you guys kidding me? So until this piece works, I'm not gonna work on this piece for execution. Right. So the environment in which I'm running this versus if somebody else is running some other components in the other test can be the same because this thing is constantly changing. Therefore, I can't rely on that. Now, if there are two completely different environments, while I'm changing this, they can continue testing the other two modules, which might be already be ready in a system test to make sure, are those two modules working together as expected, right? So you're gonna work on a different environment depending on the level of testing you're doing it. There may be a different uh, test so environment. Regression testing is nothing but the test? Yeah. Integration is I'm trying to integrate the different pieces different within pieces. the same module and are they working as expected or not, okay? So I may have a system test environment. I may have an integration test environment. And then I may also have a dedicated user acceptance test environment, right? Because it tends to be more stable. Depending on where you are in the life cycle of testing, you may be doing different testing. Okay. Also, you may have a completely different environment called loaded performance testing. Okay. That means I'm taking that Amazon example that we talked about in last week, making it sure, can it work for a million users at the same time? So the That's a load in performance. I'm putting number, the load. Number of, users. number of users. I'm increasing the load versus, hey, I'm just making it sure. Can I order it? That's a system test. Versus I'm testing it only the payment functionality. That's an integration test. Right? I may be doing, if my Payment functionality is not working. There's no point for me to try to test it whether I can place an order or not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Business point of view, it's not. Uh, not even just a business point of view. As a developer or as a tester, I know one piece is not working. Yeah. I know I can't do end-to-end -end testing because the one part is not working. Right? So if I'm put in an environment that, hey, you're testing end-to-end, -end, but knowing that doesn't work, you know it's going to fail. Why put an effort? Right. But depending on like it's the ecosystems of building a software in a big corporation is a little complex than what you think about. Okay. Because there may be multiple projects, multiple systems involved, right? So you need to make sure each is segregated appropriately for you to test it. Right. So I, I may have a 
in the Amazon example, right? I may have a payment system, right? They're doing their testing. They're making it sure, hey, I mean, can I take a new credit card? Can I take it to PayPal? Can I take it such and such payment, right? So they may evolve with that payment system or business, but they will have, hey, the last stable version is this. They give it to the end-to-end -end test environment. So that's what they're testing. But in their own environment, they will keep continuously enhancing the payment. Once it's ready, they will give it, here's the new version type of thing. Right? So there may be multiple environments in the testing that you need to think about. And each one will be depending on what is the stability of the product is and where on the life cycle. Are. And we'll talk about as we go through it, what are the different types of tests? But think about it from a test plan point of view. If I'm requiring multiple environments, I need to lay it out in my um, test plan as resources that I need. Right? Having it one set of computers to run one system test versus five sets of computers to run five different versions, it's a different expense. Right? I have to buy more machines. I have to have configure more machines. I need people to manage each one of the machines. Right? So that's a different cost, and that's part of the reason why you lay it out. Hey, what are the different types of test environment? Okay. And then final is once everything is working as expected, and the user approved it, that's when you migrate into production. Okay. Now, as a quality assurance person, you want to be very careful leaving your container for testing to either do the dev or product. Okay. If I'm running tests and I'm trying to connect to the pieces of software which are running into the development environment, the risk I'm taking it is things are changing, right? So I may not get the predictable behavior when I run the test because they are constantly changing. So it goes back to the yeah, so the developer, so the way it typically works is developer will work on their own version. They will have their own tests, all unit tests, and we'll look in a moment. But once they are happy that, hey, this is working as expected, only at that point they will give it to you. If it is not working, they won't give you. It says, hey, I'm not ready to give it to you. So, so, so what would you do at the side? So you will be still designing the test cases or sometimes you might be waiting, right? I'm done designing my test cases, but I can't do it till actually the software is available for me to test it, right? So that's what you need to think about it. That's the downside that if you go from here to here, you're increasing a lot of your work because it's constantly changing, right? So preferably that's why you will see tester which says, hey, you know what? I know you're working on it, but unless you have delivered me the right version, I can't start testing it again. There may be some scenario, right? So as part of the risk mitigation strategy, you may say, hey, you know what? You're working on the other, but the problem is environment. I need to migrate it. I needed somebody else to help me through setting up the engineering aspects of environment. So I know that software functionality that you have tested works. Therefore, there will be a rare cases that I can use it part of the development code to do my testing. Okay, but it should be very minimal for risk mitigation. So the unit test is always- um, On the development and environment. And the end of end to end test is nothing but a whole system test. So there is a system test, which is about standalone system testing. End to end testing is typically, does this system work in conjunction with all the other system that is expected to work with it? So in a case of Amazon example, right? I'll probably have a payment system. I'll probably have a shipping system. But when I drop a new version of payment system, does it work with the entire purchasing process? Right? That's an end to end test. Kind of. No, right. it's does this system work with all the other systems in the ecosystem as expected or not? That's an industry. Okay. Take an example, right? The rocket launch that we're talking about, right? 
there is a separate system which monitors the rocket, right? There is a separate system which is a control tower. There is a separate system that essentially it's on a launch bed which triggers it, right? And which controls communication back and forth between the control tower and the rocket system to say, hey, it's a go or no go, right? They validate through run through all those individual test stations on the rockets and make a decision in the command center whether it's good to go for a launch or not. And when say it's good to go for a launch, they fire up the ignition through the communication system. Right? Nobody goes there and says, let me light it up a match on that big rocket, right? It has to go through the system. So each one is separate systems, but the rocket can be launched unless all three works together as expected. Right? That's end to end. I can't purchase an item from Amazon unless my payment and shipping system is working as expected. Whatever is delayed transmission. What all is all involved in the, the integration process, yes. Mm -hmm. Then system right. Thank you. Right. So each individual system is a system. Yeah. But I'm putting together multiple systems to perform my business function. That's an end to end. In that case, like end to end, what, what I understand till now, uh, end to end means whatever we are building in terms of software, we are testing. At the end, like from the start, that's not end to end. Okay, so that's a system case, test and a UAT test. So in that case, suppose I'm I'm new in the company, I'm just like I just start like one month before, so I don't know like all the processes, like different different departments, different different process that they link with each other. So in that case, I have to learn first. All the process, all the business. Yes, that's a requirement, right? I need to know the requirements before doing my end to end testing. Yeah. I need to know how to access the ordering system, how it links with payment system. So when I start the order in the ordering system, at what point it hands off to the payment system. Okay, now I understand. So basically, in this, in the environment, they will set like, uh, yeah. Everything like you have to make sure this is all working, except the requirement, like not, nothing outside other than the requirement. It's all about the business processes. You need to have a good understanding of business processes, of how the ordering happens. And when I do the ordering, what all systems are involved? So they will tell us like, before. If they don't tell it, it's your job to find it out, talking okay. to the people. Right. That's a requirement analysis. How can you test it if you don't know what needs to be tested? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, right? And then each one is a different skills. So don't assume, hey, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. You may have multi-skilled person that you can do it entire stack, but there will be a specialization that you end up doing at each level. The other aspects, if you are a tester, you should avoid it as getting into production. Okay. There are typically two types of testing that we call it. One is a destructive testing and one is non-destructive testing. So destructive testing is essentially what changes the data in the system. Destructive? Yeah. Okay. So it changes the data in the system. Non-destructive is essentially it doesn't change the data, it doesn't change, it just reads it or it just grabs the information. Okay. You should never ever do a destructive testing going from a test environment to production. Yeah. Never else, because it changes the production environment. It is okay if you're doing a testing with, hey, I'm going to grab some data from production to read it, purpose, and then validate it. I'll give an example. I was working at the telecom company. And, and, and we have customers that are global customers, which runs a huge network. Okay. So there is a software patches that they put into what is we known as the switches, which essentially manages all the traffic. Okay. And then obviously you're going to have when people 
put the traffic, right? So if I'm a corporation, right, I may order service, internet services from one company. At some point, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I'm getting a better deal with the other company. So I'm going to essentially take away from that and put it. At that point, somebody has to go and remove all of the configuration, the switches, so that my traffic doesn't go there. It doesn't show it's used anymore. And it's free so that I can onboard other customers. Okay. So we had working in a system that says, hey, we need to recoup the capacity to understand every ports and switches which are not used yet. We need to reclaim it. We need to like reset the data on that so that it's available for the designer when they're like it's kind of designing the system to go. Okay. Somebody accidentally pointed it to the production switch instead of a test version of the switch. And they run the test. As the script works to clean up all of the ports which is no longer used. Okay. Great, I got all of the ports. Let me run an execution which cleans up now. In the middle of a broad day, that one mistake brought it down n number of corporations who got a call directly to the CEO. This is a Fortune 50 company doing the configuration, the switches. One mistake wiped out a lot of customers. Had to go back and restore all the customers. Had to, biggest impact was on the credibility of the company. You don't know what the heck you're doing. You're like wiping the production traffic in the middle of it. Right. As a tester, that's the risk if you try to test anything in production. So avoid doing anything in the production. Okay. So as a tester, you should always try to focus on this. Anything outside it, either going to increase your work or it's going to put you in trouble. Okay. Just a story. I wanted to make sure that you're cautious as you go through it why you want to focus and stay within the test environment. Yeah. Okay. So again, in the test plan, you identify that. How frequently things is going to move from here to here and what will be the condition when things should move from here to here. Okay. Then another aspect we talked about the test plan contains is the data. Okay. What data are you using in order to test it? Because remember, these are the test aspects. It's not the live production. Most of the companies prevents you to use the actual production data into the test data because of the sensitivity around the data. So, okay. And the test data should enable you to test both positive and negative test cases. And as we write the test cases, we'll talk about what means the positive and negative test cases. Okay. It also talks about how the test is going to be executed. Is it going to be executed manually or is it going to be executed in auto bin? Okay. So let's talk about a little bit what is the difference between manual testing and automated testing. Okay. Manual test is anything that requires a human intervention to do the testing. An automated testing is the script, I can write the program that will automatically test the software as it goes through. Okay. The more the manual testing you have it, the more work is whenever you have to do the regression testing in the new software because you have to redo all of those things manually. The higher the automated testing you have it, it's easier to frequently test the entire system. But there is always a trade-off, right? Essentially, you need to understand how the manual testing works before you can automate it. So, which one is more accuracy level? Accuracy level could be either one. It doesn't. Matter. It's not about accuracy level. It's about how frequent and how often okay. you test it and how long it takes you to test it. Okay. There is a lot of involvement you needed up front if you're trying to do it on automated testing. 
But think of this way. Unless you know what you need to test it, and you can test it manually once, you don't know what all to automate. So there's always a value of manual testing. But at some point, you need to start migrating into automated testing. Mainly if you're working in an agile world, we are releasing it every two weeks. You need to think about it. All of my regression testing has to finish it up within that cycle. If I don't, then I, I'll probably try to run the risk of releasing a software that is not fully tested. Okay. And you all like it's kind of see it occasionally from a time to time, right? Sometimes something is released. It didn't do all the testing or security holds, so they'll send you another patch. Go ahead and do that, right? You can, right? All it just says is that, what is the approach you're using it for the testing? Okay, later in this session, Harshal will talk about it, but this is where industry is kind of mostly heading it for sound engineering practices, as you essentially don't do any development until you have written the testing, called an acceptance test driven development. So you'll first write a failing test, and then you write a code to prove that it no longer fails. All right, so you'd go with the test first mindset. And then that helps you to get in a lot more automation. It's more or less same. The testing is still the same. It is covering the requirements, but in case of a waterfall, it will try to cover everything. In case of AGR, it will try to cover what is needed for this iteration. And does it work with the previous iteration as expected? So that's the scope, right? So scope is gonna be different from a waterfall to a job, but at the end of the day, it should still be whatever the software that you're delivering it, testing is covering that or not, right? The amount of software that you might deliver is a different from an agile to waterfall. Okay. Then also, um, a component in the test plan is around the test velocity. Velocity is nothing but something over the time period of time, right? So it just talks about how many test cases I'm executing it at what pace so that I can figure out whether I can meet my timeline or not, right? So for example, if in order to fully validate the system, I need to run 500 test cases, and I'm running only 10 cases, 10 test cases per day. It gives me a track of, hey, what is the trajectory of when I will do it? Also, how many retests I have to do it, that also changes, right? So it gives me a view on what is the projected timeline I can do it and then whether I need to worry about any contingency planning or not. So then it must be a graph or something. Those are the metrics, yeah. So you just use the metrics to do that. And then using those metrics, you generate the reports, right? So that gives you your business users as well as your uh, uh, IT partners a view of what is the status of the system is, right? And again, uh, you create multiple test reports throughout the life cycle, right? Sometimes you do it, hey, I'm writing the test cases in the design phase. How many test cases you need to write it? versus how many you already completed. Gives me a trajectory of how much more time I needed to finish writing all the test cases. Same thing with the execution. Another aspect that gives you is, remember we said the system is broken down into multiple functions. You can start doing view as, hey, system is broken down into 10 functions of which, which all functions are working, which functions are still showing bugs, which functions have more bugs compared to the others, all of those reports gives you an idea of what is the quality of the software. <coughs> and then when you talk about it, right, we'll talk about the age of defects and the defect distribution, right? Essentially how long this defect is open, 
Is it open for 10 days? Is it open for 20 days? Gives you an idea of, hey, at what point I'm going to get it? And what is the average turnaround time for getting it from development team? With those fixes that, that I need to project it while all testing it's going to need to do it. There is a point uh, for uh, average age of uh, the fixed mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, From my understanding, I'm thinking like that. Uh, how long the the fact is open? Yeah. And so if I have ten defects open, right? Some are open for three days, some are open for five days. And so I try to like get the graph to understand what is the average time it's taking it, so I can predict it. If there are ten defects. It's going to take me this much time to get the fixes, and it's going to take me this much time to retest those things. Right? So, all these reports are essentially a indicator to say, "Am I going to meet my timeline or not?" And what is the quality I'm going to get it? That's what this is all about. Okay. Same thing. It's like it's at the functional level. I want to see what functions are working, what functions were working before, and what kind of patch is brought in, which essentially cause a problem with those functions. Okay. There are a whole bunch of other defect types and the reports that you can talk about it is how many are open versus how many are fixed, right? So if your defect open rate is higher than the rate that their fixes are coming in, you know it's gonna take a longer time to do it, right? Uh, we talked about the average age we talked about defect distribution, which component has how many defects, what is the probability of that. Then you also talk about the severity level, right? Which tests are like it's more important, critical versus when you find an error, which one are cosmetic, right? So when I find a problem, there's going to be different levels of complexity in there. Right. Something maybe just a cosmetic versus something maybe a really important. So if I'm taking credit application in the art form, right? But if I can take a social security number, you know that that's an important element for a lender to decide whether you're credit worthy or not, right? That's a critical error. It better get fixed it before I can release the software versus it's a cosmetic hey, the background on this page is white instead of it needs to be green. That's a cosmetic, right? As long as functionality is working, yeah, probably it's a defect, but I can live with that defect. I can be okay in the production environment with that defect, right? So it's, what is the severity? What do I need to do it in order to restore back the value? Is it critical versus it's only cosmetic? And then there is also the priority level, which defects I should fix first versus which defects I can fix at a later point. Okay. And again, there are a whole bunch of metrics, right? Each company will look for a little bit different metrics, but here are some of the common ones, right? How many paths I tested versus how many acceptance criteria I tested. It gives me an indicator of how I'm moving the needle towards the completion. And here are some of the test tools that essentially goes into that. So let, let's do a one quick exercise so you understand the impact that as a quality assurance person, you produce it during the planning phase. Okay. Everybody read the requirements document? Yes? No? Right. Like, you understood it. What is the functionality and what do you need to do to test it? Right. So, my question to all of you is if I come around and say, okay, can you guys tell me how long it will take you to test the system? You understand the requirements now. Can you tell me how long it will take you to do all of your testing activities? Any guess? Because remember, I have to give an estimate to my business users how long it'll take it, right? 
So I need to understand how many days you will take it to do all of the testing activity. So I can include that in my cost and tell it to them. Right now, it looks like a lot. <laughs> how much? If I tell you, but put a number. How many resources are there to work on? You are alone to work on it. Tell me how long it'll take him. Because you can't predict for somebody else. You can't estimate. Yeah. So let's estimate for yourself. How much time do you think you will need? What months? I think we have to ask developers first. How much time they will take? To, to I'm not even talking about the timeline. Yeah. I'm just saying is that now you know what activities you need to do it. You know what testing you need to do it because you read the requirements document. Mm -hmm. How long it will take to you? Let me worry about the developers later. I'm getting costs from you, same way I'm getting costs from developers. I'm not asking you timeline. All I'm asking you, tell me how much effort you need. Three to four weeks. Three to four weeks? Is it three weeks? It's a four week. Four weeks. Four weeks. Let's, Let's go with four weeks, weeks, right? Let's do it four weeks. Right? Yeah. And when you say it's a four week, is it four working weeks or four calendar weeks? Working closing. Okay. So each week has a working day's five? Five weeks, yeah. Right? So you're giving me an estimate that it roughly it will take 20 days. 20 days. Actually, you know what I should do? I should do it on online so that everybody online also can see it. You're saying it, it takes it 20 days. Anybody else thinks it'll take more or less than 20 days? I'm telling you, you have the requirements document, you need to test all of that. <laughs> How many more? Um, so you're saying one month, one, one to two months. Okay, two months. Okay. One to two months is not a good way. I'll tell you. If if I'd be your boss, I'd say you go redo some work. Right? I, so plus minus 10% is acceptable. One to two, it's 100% variation. I can't deal with that. Two months, which is three days. Somebody online had. Something like three months going back and forth between developers. Again, I'm not saying going back and forth. I'm not looking timeline. I'm looking okay. at how much effort it is required. How much that effort I would say rough, three months, roughly. That is 60 days? Three months is around 90 days. Uh, Again, we are not... Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, good, yeah, 60 days, yes. I have one question. What is the parameter? Like, why, how we can decide like 20 days, 20 days, and 60 days? That's I'm telling you to get, get your gut all, feeling. We have some calculation. You all use software in the your world, right? Yes. It should be at some point or some guidelines. I, I completely understand. Right? All I'm asking you is, based on your gut feeling, how many days do you think it will require? If we consider, you know, automation, then will be, then it will, it might be, you know, twenty or twenty-five days. Again, I'm not expecting automation. I'm just saying that this is the system what it will take you to test it. If you want to automate, that's fine, your call. But I'm not requiring you to do automation. So is it a question from like... Yeah, I'm the project manager. He wants to know... I need to know how long, what is the amount of effort you needed in order to test the system that you just read it that we need to deliver for customers. So you tell me based on that. It should be like 60 days at least. Again, if I go as a contractor to a customer, right, and customer asks me how long, how many days it's going to take you to build my house? I said, no, 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 I'll wait six to nine months. It's what is customer's question. reaction going to be? Like, is, a huge is it six months or is it nine? nine Six to seven months, understandable, but six to nine months is like huge. So I'm asking all of you, if I have to say it is, hey, I will pay you 
to test the system, you tell me how many days of effort you will require. So I will see how many test cases uh, the whole system you will make. <laughs> when I go to contractor to build a house, he doesn't tell me. <laughs> I need to see it, how many lumber trips I need to make it to home depot, right? That's an indication to me that you don't know what you're doing. I will not give my house construction order to you. Still less than 10 days. Less than 10 days, okay. Hey, hang on, can you say it loud? I can't hear it, they can't hear it. Ah. So the question in the room is, shouldn't they be telling me? So if I'm a contractor trying to bid a, for NASA to build that rocket that goes to moon, is it better for NASA to ask me how long it's gonna take me to build it? Or is it better for NASA to say, it's, okay, build it in two months? So the customer said many times also it comes like, yeah, specification that like you have to go in two months or three months, everything. Like, let's say they would say, in a year, we want this project to be done, development, testing, everything. So, so in we that way, we can uh, do it quickly, but to find it more people, like five, 10 testers, then yeah, 20 days. I'm going to say a word that most of you will hate me saying it. <laughs> it's no mean to be sensitive with it. Right? It's just a fact. You can't have nine women to produce a baby in a month. Right? It may sound insensitive, right? But that's the reality. That's what you're asking is, hey, if I throw more people at the work, can I get the work done sooner? And the answer is sometimes it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Right? So yes, users have an expectation. But you need to match the expectation with the reality. If I tell you, hey, you know what? Uh, Githi, it's much more easier. As a customer, I wanted that system yesterday. I give you a one day. Can you build and give it to me? I'll give you a million dollars. No. Why not? It's you not just said it. So let me define it. Try my best. You can do that. <laughs> is my try my best is going to be good? I'm going to give you a million dollars like, to just do your try your best? No, sir. I'll, I'll negotiate like you did the contract. I'll do it in the according to the I go. That's the point, right? I'm asking you guys to get the input. Here is the reason I'm asking. Right? I'm not doing an exercise just to have fun, right? I want you to say it's what is your gut feeling is telling you? And then we're going to do the same thing at the end of the course after you know what all is required for a quality assurance person to do it. And I want you to say it's how much on track you are with your gut feeling or how much off you are with your gut feeling. So I saw it range from 10 days to 60 days. Those are drastically different ranges. Right? And obviously, you all have some basis in your mind when you say it's going to take 10 days versus it's going to take me 60 days, right? And based on past history, a lot of times people don't think it. They just throw a number. Right? should never ever do it. Don't throw the numbers. Because based on your numbers, there are things that is decided on the project. There are people, the plans on the business side is done on those numbers. As I think Nathan, you were asking earlier, what if I don't do this? Am I going to get fired? Trust me. If you do not deliver the value without putting some due diligence, there will be those situations that happen. The consequences. The consequences is always there, right? It's part of adulthood. You can't just have all the fun. You take responsibility with it too, right? And in this case, it is okay to go off. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you have used some sort of due diligence to come to that number, that's what the conversation needs to come. If somebody says 60 days, right? I'll just say, how did you come with 60 days? As long as you have some logic that you can explain, how did you come with that 60 days? People are reasonable. They will listen to it and say, okay, we give you 60 days. We put the risk contingency. There are things happen. Right? Nobody's going to hold you accountable for things that happen which is outside your control. 
but did you do your best due diligence or not? That's what it's all about. So when a project manager comes to you and says, go do testing, right? When you throw a number 60 days, well, what basis do you use this? A lot of times we use a term called back up the paper napkin calculations. Most of us do that in the software world. There's nothing wrong with it, but there has to be some justification around it. Let's say if I say it's okay, what are the factors? Well, I need to think about how many test cases. I think somebody mentioned it. Hey, tell me how many test cases, right? So the question is going to be you read the requirements document, you tell me how many test cases you will need it to test it. Right? You're not expecting your project manager to tell you, hey, I need 50 test cases. You have the requirements. You tell it, hey, you know what? For this sets of requirement, I think it's going to take me 40 complex test scenarios and 20 medium complex. Roughly, based on a history, it takes it 10 days to do a complex test scenario and five days to do this. But you use those kind of logic to say, here is how many test cases we're going to have it. Here's how many scenarios you're going to have. Therefore, it's going to take me this much time. All right. So you use that basis to stop. But then that's not the only thing you're doing, right? You have to account for it. Hey, what happens? It's not the perfect world. What happens is if I get defects and I have to do regression testing? How much retesting I'm expecting to do it? How long that will take it? Also, you spend the time reading the requirements document, right? It's not free. You need to think about, it's going to take a time. As you read through it, it's taking your hours, right? You have to execute, re-execute, and all it's going to take time. Also, the fact that, hey, I wrote it this scenario, but as I learned it more, I may need to add a few more test cases. What is the average plus minus percentage that I need to use it to feel the comfortable level? So all those calculations goes into the factor of providing it's how many days it's going to take. Okay. So typically it's in your test plan towards the end, but essentially there are two factors that you use. Right? One is you take the breakdown and says, hey, you know what? I'm trying to like get back up the paper napkin calculation is I know how many users I have it. Right? I can break it down by users because I need to test every user functionality in the system. I can break it down. What are the scenarios or what are the things that they do it? Right, site administrator logs in, they create, manage the dealer, manage the user. They have to do all those work, right? What are the different complexities involved? Roughly how many test cases I think I can do it on those. Use that, right? So you come up with the numbers. And then use those numbers to essentially then plug into some sort of a template that enables you to come up with this thing. So for us, when we put together, the rough estimate came around, it's going to take us 67 days for us to test the system. Okay. And then that factored in the various things, including all of the design phase activity. That means I'm gonna do the analysis of the requirements. I'm gonna break it down into test scenarios and write those test cases. And then execution aspects, how long it's gonna take me to run those test cases, right? And if you look at that, that's already put in some factor. Around. I'm gonna get the defect. I'm gonna retest some of that, okay? And then I'm expecting it to provide some support and then I put a contingency factor, just in case there are nodes that I'm not knowing yet that I'm gonna encounter into it, how much time I have to deal with it, right? So when I give this number, now it's based on certain calculation, based on certain model, right? So even if I do it instead of 67 days, ends up 70 days or 65 days, that's still within the range, people will do that. And if something drastically changes, then we need to talk about is 67 days is still a valid estimate. Okay. To use that kind of calculation to figure out how long it's going to take me. And that estimate is what you give it to the project manager, gets integrated into it. 
right? Also realize that the 60, the 67 day, it's an effort. It doesn't mean that, hey, as soon as I get the requirements, I'll be done with testing in 67 days, as you pointed out, right? There's a dependency on the developers. If they give me system at the end of 90 days, I can't do my work in 67 days, right? This is the effort. What timeline? That's going to be a different aspect of it. Is that, hey, I'm going to get my software three months from the time that they start the development. After that, I needed this many days to execute it because I can do the parallel designing of test cases while they are building the code, right? So there's going to be some overlap. So it's not flat all that. So it's essentially sequencing of how we do it. Now, if you look into the agile world, right? It's a different estimation aspect. It just says it, hey, I'm going to do it in two weeks, right? At that point, it just says, in two weeks, I can test this much. So that becomes the scope. But then you're still trying to do it over multiple sprints to do it. This is the total effort that's going to be. You had a question? Mm -hmm. So my question is, sir, the, the, the thing is that you, you already showed us like a like, fixed format, like 67 days format. So how can we decide like this particular thing that it, is there any fixed format or fixed pattern or so, procedure? So in terms of format, every company will have a little bit different variations. Okay. What it means is though, you need to think about what are the activities that you're gonna involve and how much time you need to take it. So that's why you, if you look at it, right? The way we have broken down is, hey, I know how many different things I need to do it in design phase, right? So if you look at design phase, it's essentially understanding the existing apps, understanding the requirements, writing out the test plan. I need to come up with a test environment setup. Right. I, I need to do some sort of the test case development. It's going to take me this much hours, right? So it talks all about the design activity. So you need to have a good understanding and you will know it as we go through it. Hey, what are all things I need to do it in order to take a requirement to the point where I can validate this requirement works. So, so my question is so like everything like like first step. What is the first step? Like if we are calculating things, so like everything has first step, like on the basis of on first step. What did step, I ask all of you to do it first homework? So three requirement. So understanding the requirements, understanding the scope is the first so step. Is there any like this thing or like we can guess on it? Like suppose I'm I'm feeling, but my feeling is saying, hey, it will take three to four months. So three to four months, I understand. Like, but if I'm like you are my boss, if I'm saying to you, sir, I will take like four months. So you you will leave me or you with some justifications or how if I like. I, I change like instead of four, I, I um, might change like five or six. You will believe me or like as per you, you are expert. You can do like in a three days, but like I'm not like capable like you. So I'm taking five days. So are you going to allow me or? Depends again, it's culture, right? Okay. If I would do it, normally most of the managers do it is when you give an estimate, Right. Remember, they have power experience. Sometimes we don't. Like I work on platforms. I used to do a lot of development hands-on till like eight years ago. I don't write much code anymore. I'm more at the architecture, more at strategy level. So when somebody throws me a number, right? There are two factors that comes into it. It's the credibility, how credible you are against the estimate that you have given in the past. That comes into your mind. First thing as a human. Second thing comes to mind is, okay, you gave me four months. Can you tell me how, how did you arrive at this four months? Can you explain it to me, right? And then you can challenge, right? If you say, hey, it's gonna take me three months just to read the requirements. Then I would say, can you elaborate more? Why would it take you three months, right? Obviously, I, I always have, 
understanding of the skills of the people, right? Sometimes you have to trust it. But if I'm like, it's purely a, con a person who's handing out the contract, right? All I'm gonna ask it is, if you give me the due diligence that you gave me, that why it takes me this much, somebody else gave me the same due diligence, and they're gonna be a less time, then I'm gonna go with them, right? Because they have more skill. But at the same time, I'm not just gonna blindly give it to them because I'm gonna have an understanding if, hey, I send it to four vendors, here's the range come in and one person is way below, one person is way off. Probably I'm not gonna deal with any of those because one is very aggressive, the other one is very conservative. It's so most likely it's gonna be somewhere in between. Right? So a lot of times it comes in experience where I want you guys to think about it. And Nathan, I think it's, you're hung up on defensive mechanism. Hey, I give you a number. And if I don't deliver on that number, I'm gonna get fired. That's not the scenario. All it does is that, did you come up with that number? based on a reasonable estimate or reasonable model. Okay. That is always going to be when you run into a new technology. I may be a very good developer at Java and I can want, kick it off everything as quickly. But when I'm dealing with a completely new a new language like Kotlin or anything, right? I'm going to put in factor that hey, you know what I don't know that. I'm going to probably take some time to learn that language. So when I give you an estimate, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take the first week to learn about it. And then I will implement it effectively. So to implement, it's going to be, it take me two weeks. But the reality, it's only one week and one week of learning. Because you don't want me to implement without knowing what I'm implementing here. Right? But if you tell me that, hey, I was an Kotlin expert and you're giving me, then I would anticipate that that number is going to come down to five days. Right, so it's going to be based on a skill. If I tell you that, hey, you're going to automate all the testing, do you have a skill, or are you going to learn it and then automate it? It's two different kinds. Of right, as long as you come up with a model and justification of how you come up to that number, that's okay. Everybody understands. It. Right, and as a project manager, if I'm not comfortable, I will challenge. It doesn't matter whether it's a low number or up number. I'll challenge either, right? So that like it's understand, do you know what you're doing? That's what it boils down to at the end of the day, right? So when everybody throw an estimate from 10 days to 60 days, the question is, do you know, how did you come to that number, right? So if you give me 60 days, right? My first question is, everybody else is taking 10 or 20 days why would I go with you? Because you're more expensive to do it 60 days, both from a timeline cost point of view and the business opportunity point of view. You with me? Understand why I need an estimate, because I need to give it to the client. Yeah. This is how much it's going to take me. Right? Even in the agile world, right? Even though we do it, we do a rough planning. So it says, yeah, every two weeks, I'm going to deliver this functionality. But that is, it's, hey, this sort of capabilities, it's going to take me three months to deliver. I'll deliver parts and pieces as we go every two weeks. But the full functionality, it will take this much time. We still do all of those plans. And all of those goes back into the historical of how predictable you are and how accurate you are in terms of your predictions. Okay. And nobody's expecting you to have a hundred percent accurate every time on everything. And then I look that you don't want to push the customer. You can push you that like, in this area that way you can push the customer and then you can like it might work on you. Yeah. So, yes and no. Right? Typically, human nature is going to do that. But if you keep pushing it, 
And if my development team has to work overtime every time to deliver on it, how long are they going to stick around with me? I, I can't do anything, but I'm like spending 80 hours a week just doing this development when normal work hours is 40 hours a week. How long are you going to sustain that? Right? So there's always a cultural aspect. Are you looking for a balanced and a really productive team? Or are you looking for somebody just jamming the hours to do it? I'll tell you, like most of us, after about like it's 12 to 13 hours a day, even though you put the physical time, you're mentally not productive. So most of the yeah, and what you're going to see it in those, they're not going to be people going to be sticking around for long. They will find an alternate job and they leave it. So they vote it with their actions. I would not worry too much about it. What I would worry about it is the estimate that we give it, is it reasonable? And what is the assumptions, right? So if you look into it, this assumption of 67 days was given day for nine hours a day of actual productivity, right? So they're saying, hey, I'm roughly working about nine hours a day. And that's what it's gonna take me. This is probably an hourly time. But they are trying to like see what they can do. If anything more than that, the assumption is wrong. See, it's a nine hour day, but actual productivity is only eight hours a day because one hour will be spent in the meetings, status updates, and those kind of things. All right. So that's where they're focusing on. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's do 10 minutes, 15 minute break. And then we'll jump into what are the different types of testing. Okay. And the homework. I would ask you guys to read that third document into that slide called test plan document. Okay. So I'll give you more or less kind of same understanding of what we talked about. Okay. I have one question. Yes. Yes. So usually how many test cases a person can execute in a day normally, like depending upon the com complexity or the simplicity or the experience? It depends on a system to system, right? Mm -hmm. And it's more about so you, what we're going to talk about as we go through the next few session is how you take a requirement, break it down, understand how many test cases you needed to test that requirement. And as you get an experience, that's when you start putting together estimates. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. One more thing also, like... Who is responsible for maintaining the test environment? Is it we or like, you know, some other uh, group or uh, some other? Depends. Like, yeah. Depends. A lot of times if tester has that skill, they do it, but they will always need and help move from infrastructure type of teams to manage and maintain it. So you will do it a little bit of application stuff based on what you are skills and capabilities, but typically there's a dedicated team that manages the environment or dedicated okay. manages that environment. Because we will not having any, you know, access to the production. So if we want to see the live data, how it is and, uh, you know, uh, the volume and everything. So these all are going to be uh, handled by the that particular group. Yeah, yeah that's typically it is. So most of the firms, typically, if you have access to dev and test environment, you don't have access to production environment. That's a regulatory requirement called SOX compliance. So it's a cyber Oxley rules, which essentially enables you to access from any of the personal information of the people, right? Think about it if you're working on healthcare, mm -hmm. you don't want your developers to have access to your personal health information. Same thing for your banking and those kind of things. So there is a dedicated team, which essentially provides you help and support with some of those data. But if you're dealing with non-sensitive data, 
then you may have to come up with that. That's why when you, one of the aspects in the test plan is talk about what is the test data and how do I you know, get, get about it. Okay, let's say there are a couple of other questions. Where do I find QA estimate worksheets? Um, those are should be accessible in your folder. It's part of the test plan document. But if you don't have it, uh, I and Herschel will follow up to make sure it's in that folder. Yeah, it should be there. Yeah, you can think about it. Herschel and I play around. Herschel is take care of so the infrastructure and more kind of a functionality guy. So. Any other questions we have? Smita, you had a question? Um, so one more question, I think. So uh, while preparing this ten, uh, test plan document, do we update it or like any, any kind of versioning we are going to do with that? Typically or you do. Typically you do based on if there are any changes in the requirement or changes in the uh, situations, then you do it. But once it gets signed it, you try to hold it to it, unless there is a significant risk description that you need to have it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think somebody might be in there. This meeting is being recorded. All right. So we talked about the test plan. Let's talk about the specific test. Remember, like it's in the V model, there are a whole bunch of terms that I threw it in the middle. The UAT testing, the unit testing, the link testing. Well, what does all those things mean? And what are the different types of testing you're going to be able to do? So when you go at the work, right, people will talk about, hey, are you done unit testing? Are you doing a black box testing or white box test? But what does all this terminology mean? That's what we're going to talk about. Eh? Then we'll talk a little bit briefly about the defect management and defect management lifecycle. And then we're going to start getting into the activity from tomorrow morning. So today is the last day that you're going to see me standing up and talking for four hours. Okay. You don't have to deal with me talking four hours starting tomorrow. No, we understand we'll concept. start doing the things. <laughs> right? I'll still talk, but not for a continuous four hours. Okay. Does that help? All right. So there's a whole bunch of terms. I'm going to talk about those terms. But the intention of this particular unit is to make sure you understand what are the different types of testing. And importantly, understand two aspects for every time. When it is done and who does it. Okay. And then we'll start working on a lot of those tests as we go through it starting tomorrow. Okay. So the first lens that people put on testing is static versus dynamic testing. So let's talk about static testing. It's typically, it's a testing that you do it without executing any. It's more like an inspection type of testing. Okay. 
So typically when you do reviews, right, I ask all of you to do, hey, go ahead and review the test documents, uh, the requirements document, right? And make sure requirement documents fulfills three C and T condition, right? So all you did it is you did a static testing. Is the requirements good enough to get started or not? Okay. Another type of testing typically people do it is through peer reviews. So a lot of times developer work in pair, right? They look at each other's code and make sure, is this code supposed to do this? Is it doing that thing or not? They're not running anything. They're just like, it's kind of reviewing it. That's an inspection, right? It's still a static testing. Another aspect of testing is for those of you who have a little bit background in development, right? Typically the way <coughs> this developer writes the code in some sort of language, whether it's a Java or C++ or C sharp type of things, right? Those languages, just like your English, French, any other language that you do it, right? It has a grammar, it has a syntax, it has a rules around it, right? So when you write a piece of software, right? Those first half thing, whatever you wrote it, does it meet the rules of the language, the syntax, right? Typically that's done through something known as an integrated development environment or compilers. So you actually write a piece of code, run through compiler to make sure it's syntactically correct. You're not running it as software yet. All you're doing is, is this right language or not? Right? That's a, still a static testing, okay? The actual dynamic testing occurs when you're actually executing that piece of code that you wrote it, okay? So typically those kind of testing is conducted throughout the life cycle of the software development. It's typically starts at the requirement phase, and goes all the way. Okay. And it, it, there is a lot of companies in the modern engineering practices that go through a job. They focus on a lot of emphasis on a pair programmer, what is we call it a mob programmer. So one person is like it's driving the keyboard and collectively the team is like telling him, hey, think about this, why didn't we add this condition, this condition, and they're dynamically typed as they go through it. That's nothing but one sort of uh, static testing. We're telling you and reviewing your code as you're typing it to make sure everything is right. Okay? The whole purpose of this thing is to verify. Is it gonna work the way it is expected? Can I verify it's gonna work? Okay. Versus the dynamic testing is when I'm actually executing the software, okay? So when you go through the design phase, till then you're doing most of them as a static testing. After the design phase, you're doing both static and the dynamic testing. So in order to do dynamic testing, I need to do actual execution, okay? And primary purpose of the dynamic testing is to validate, is the system working as expected? Right, so one is verified. Is it gonna work the way it's expected versus is it working the way it's expected is a validation, okay? Any questions on that view, static versus dynamic? So static is all kind of reviews. Sort of reviews, inspections, no execution. Dynamic is actual execution. The second set of testing. Sorry, uh, real, real quick. Sorry. <clears throat> Do we have to remember all these terms? You don't. Like, like, uh, uh, like at, uh, on a corporate level, like, do they use this, this kind of term? Like, can you do this kind of test or they be specific about what they want? Yeah. So, my recommendation, I mentioned that earlier to um, the class here also. Don't worry about memorizing anything. Okay. Okay. The more you practice it, the more it will become a natural to you. Okay. So that you can memorize. Think about it, right? When you drive the car, do you memorize things? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. What it is, right. what it is, the accelerator now, right? It just becomes a muscle memory. Right. If somebody talks that term, you exactly know, right? If, so if I tell my daughter sitting next to it, hit the brake, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. It's a muscle yeah. memory, right? They just hit the brake. I don't have to tell you where the brake is and how do you apply the brake. Right? So it's similar kind of thing. The more you practice, it'll, the more it'll become a muscle memory. You just need to be aware of these different terms so that like it's you, when somebody talks, you know exactly what they're meaning is. So does that mean the dynamic testing will have test cases and the static testing will not have any test cases? Not necessarily. So static testing could still have a test steps. Test cases, they may have a validation type of things, but typically people don't write test cases for static testing. Okay. Right. So yes, most likely you're not going to see it, but that doesn't mean that you can't write one for it. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So the next set of terms that you're going to hear it is a black box testing versus a white box testing. Okay. What black box testing is, is that I'm going to test the software without knowing how it's actually internally implementation details. Right. So when you are like, it's ordering something on Amazon today, does anyone of you know exactly how it's implemented behind the scene? You don't, right? But if I tell you, hey, go over and like it's do a dry run testing of that ordering platform on Amazon, right? That's a black box testing. You don't know how actually internally all the details are implemented. And typically UAT testing are a black box test because your users don't know how things are implemented. Okay. And the goal for that is to understand what aspects of testing, right? What is the software supposed to do it? Right. It's supposed to give me an ordering capability. I'm supposed to do this and that, right? So a lot of times the black box testings are more known also as a specification-based testing. I'm telling you what the system should be doing it and is the system doing that or not? Versus white box testing is I know internally how the system is implemented. I know there is a separate ordering system. I know there is a separate payment system. And I'm going to test it so that is the connection from ordering to the payment platform working as expected or not. That's a black uh, white box system. Because I have an internal knowledge. All of the unit testings are white box testing because I know exactly how the code is written. I'm going through every path and make sure every path works. Okay. So a lot of times you will see it as a how aspects of the software, how it is performing. Okay. So that's two different contexts. Now, another sets of terms that people use it based on the scope of the testing. Okay. So it starts with the unit testing, okay? Typically the unit testing is typically done when you're more to specifically verify a certain piece of code, whether it's working or not, okay? It's a lowest level of testing. Think about smallest software piece is what I'm testing at this point, okay? You will hear sometimes people into a exchange use unit testing and a component testing, it's unit. It's typically done during early part of the development life cycle. And it's mostly done by the development team. Okay, so you as a quality assurance person, you don't know how the code is written. You're not a code expert. You're not doing business. It's done by the development team. Remember like it's the three environments I've talked about, the leftmost environment, which was around the development sandbox. That's where this testing happens. Developers are doing it. Okay. Versus, I go and say, okay, now I've wrote a small piece of code, now I'm building it together. Remember the analogy I gave you around the puzzle? I'm built, joining a tree, right? I'm making sure two pieces are connecting it as you need this. Then I'm making sure the root, the stem, 
and the leaves are connected properly, that's an integration test. But still, I need to know how the roots is connected to the stem, how the stem is connected to the leaves and so on, right? So it is still done in the development environment, still done by the developers. They're trying to integrate the various pieces of code together to form a module. That's what this is about. Okay. And typically it happens in a little bit later stage in the development life cycle. So the developer first writes a small piece of code, write another small piece of code, and then trying to bring it together, make sure all of them are working together. That's the integration testing. Okay. Let's skip this too, and I'll come back later. The next set of testing we're going to talk about is system testing. Okay. So think analogically. I wrote the small piece of code, another small piece of code, reading it together. It worked fine. Now I have a working module. I'm going to bring another working module, make sure those two works together. That's a system test. Okay. This is typically done in the middle platform environment. Remember what we talked about in the testing environment. That's where the system testing starts from there. So now I'm pulling it together, two pieces of software. This is where I, as a quality assurance person, starts getting involved, making sure are those two pieces working together, right? Next one is regression testing. So this is, goes back led into your question. Hey, I found the bug, I fixed it. I gave a new version to the testing team. Now, are they responsible to do everything again or just the things that I fixed them? I have to do everything again and that term is known as regression testing. It's essentially validating the piece of software that was working before and making sure, well, not valid, sorry, verifying, because this is an execution aspect of it. So it is verifying the piece of software that was already working before, it is still working as expected. <laughs> and it's done by testing, and it's typically performed during the testing phase. So regression, regression testing uh, will be at the end, or it, 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 it's, it's a continuous process. I found a bug, I gave it to developer to fix it. They fixed it and they gave me a new version. I'm not done finished testing yet. I'm taking that new version of software, testing first, a bug is fixed. And if the bug is fixed, now I'm testing everything else to make sure that doesn't break anything else. So that was working before. Before the like, deployment, Regression testing is a continuous process. Whenever there is a change, we do the regression. Precisely. So just in case, at the end, like whenever we did everything and developer fixed something, like something, like we don't know mm -hmm. what he did, but at the end, we found like it is not expecting like what we are expecting. That's yeah. still a bug, right? So that ball comes to God or again. Nitin, I think you need to start getting away from the mindset that it's us versus them. Yeah, I, why, why I, I'm I? hearing in all those questions, right? Because it's a comfort level that you're trying to look at. What is my responsibility? What is their responsibility? No, I don't think it that way. Not, 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 I'm not asking for that prospect. Basically, that my question because you know every everybody is responsible for own work. Like that is true, right? I'm not like saying, hey, this is you, this is me, and like this is on you. It, it's a team work. I understand team work. But the thing is, whatever I am doing, it is my responsibility completely. Because that thing I can like say, hey, uh, this is uh, you, or I can I can't blame anything. Like right? so the thing is, if I'm finding something at the end, and like again, I don't know how and why. Again, so it, that's where the problem comes. If you don't know how and why find you found the problem, that's a problem. That's a problem, okay. Right? If you follow the right process, you should find the problem during the process. If yeah. you didn't follow the process and you found something else outside that domain, so what actually it, happened? Technically, it is not possible. No, you need to understand what happened. Okay. Didn't I follow the process? If I'm supposed to follow the process, then I should have found it during the process. Yeah. 
not because me, because they are continuously fixing something and they break something. Again, okay. your responsibility as a regression testing is to make sure when they gave you a new version, they didn't break anything else. Okay. That's why you're rerunning the test. Wow. Right? Oh, and if you rerun the test and all this test passed, that means they didn't break anything else. Okay. So many times we can like anytime that anybody performs any change. You need to go back and make sure they didn't break anything else. Okay. Think about a plumber coming to your house. Right? You had a leakage in a pipe. He fixes that. You need to make sure he didn't break anything else in the plumbing system. Yeah, that, that thing I understand, but there is no limitation. Like as as many times, like if they yeah. are not fixing properly and I'm finding something, so I can send them back. Mm -hmm. No matter like how many times. Yeah. Is what is your responsibility? Yeah. To find like to so find the bug. No bug. No, right? no, no mistake. So as long as you're finding the bug, you tell them. Now, how long that cycle continues, that's probably not your call. Okay. So Somebody is, else with a higher pay grade and a higher salary is making that decision for you. So they will take the decision, but it is not like on me why you are finding like continuously or well, they're not going to blame you for developer who didn't fix things properly, right? But you're just uncovering the error so that you are identifying the risk for the software. No, I am No. Yes. Uh, so, like, uh, if you from like that, uh, like earlier to say that high priority bus or the low priority bus, um, if we found the low priority bus, we know that uh, maybe it's okay. We still tell them, or we just you still identify all the bugs, right? Think about it. At the end of the day, it's all decision are based on two things, the risk and the money, okay? Based on, if you can mitigate those two things, it is okay to go in production with the defect. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? But the question comes in, is if I release this software, is there a risk and is there a financial impact? That's all you, at the end of the day that you talk about it. All of the priority discussions, all the severity levels is designed to essentially help it. What is the risk level I'm dealing with? It? Is it gonna be a financial impact or not? They could have very well, like it's when they launch a rocket tomorrow, they may find it's, hey, it's not perfect. There are three flags, which the alert went off, but we'll make a decision on the real time, is it okay to have, right? Because most of the life-sustaining systems always have two or three levels of backup. So if your primary fails, as long as secondary kicks in and works as expected, you still continue, you don't stop, right? The doctors goes in the surgery room, right? They know, hey, I'm in the middle of surgery, something else goes wrong, I don't stop the surgery. Right? I deal with that situation at that point and run with it. But I make the decision. Right? That's all it's all about at the end of the day. All the software is about making the decision when to release it and when it's appropriate to release it. All is a quality assurance. You're giving is a mirror and reflection how good and stable the software is. That's all you're doing. As long as you follow the process, as long as you build the right sets of test cases, you will do your due diligence. That's all it matters. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a first level of integration. I wrote it. Think of it, right? I'm building a puzzle, right? What is the first level? Joining two pieces together, right? I'm building a tree of the big part of the puzzle. I start putting those two pieces together. Those two pieces connect well, great. I have another two pieces that works together. I try to bring it together, all four pieces, to see if they are connected together or not. That's integration <coughs> testing. That's still developer is doing. But in the environment section. So that integration is a little bit different. It's eight system level integrations with the other things. Oh, okay. Right? I'm talking at the testing that's level. Good. That one is an environment. This one is the testing yeah. definition. Sorry about that. Okay. 
So that's about the regression testing. Are you clear about that? Yeah, one question. Uh, uh -huh. Like suppose, yeah, we have two components and uh, like one component is having almost 30 test cases and another component is having around, uh, you know, 60 test cases. And when we integrate it and do this regression testing on those, and do we have to completely run this 50 and 30 test cases or we prioritize some of the test cases here too? So when you do regression testing, you run everything. Everything. Any, so when the when the whole application is going to develop, okay, when it is, when it is small, it is fine. Like you know, when it grows more bigger, then how this you know how they are going to manage all running all the test cases. That's where the automation comes in play. That's where the risk, right? You may decide, hey, certain functionality is completely unrelated, right? So even in regression testing, you identify the scope of change and the influence of change. And then you make a decision on this. Okay. okay. The next one, the term that you're going to use is functional testing. But let me go to the two that I skipped before that. Okay. So there are two other terms that you're going to hear from developers and testers. And the one is called scenic testing. The other one is called the smoke test. Okay. So think about it. A developer gives you a new version of software. Okay. What is the first thing you're going to do? With? Let's say I give you that you have to test a website. A developer give you a new version of software. The first thing you're going to do it is you're going to just Actually, go to that home page you know, and see if it comes up or not. Right? You're just going to perform some sanity that, hey, whatever you gave me, is it even working so that I can continue with testing or not? Right? So if you're doing that, that's called a sanity testing. You gave me a new piece of software. Is it even good enough for me to get started? Right? That's typically done in the test environment by testing, because whenever a developer gives you a new version, that's what you do us. Okay. The second term that you hear is a smoke testing. Okay. The goal for the smoke testing is that, hey, I got a new version of software and it's up. I could access the home page. But is that sufficient for me to begin the testing? So I'm doing a sanity that system is ready to test it, but I'm also to do is, is it sufficient for me to begin testing? Okay. And that aspect is, let's say, typically you're accessing a, let, let's say if it's a bank application that essentially allows you to check your balances, right? There's probably gonna be most of components that there's gonna be an application tier. There's gonna be a database tier somewhere that stores all of your account information. Remember we talked about multi-tier architecture, there's a data tier, and then there is application tier, and there is a presentation tier, right? So do I have all those tiers up so that I can actually do the test, right? So typically, can I log in into the system? So sanity testing is, can I bring up the home page? Smoke testing is, can I log in so is all the components working for me to get started? That's smoke testing. It's also done by the testing. Okay. And make sure the purpose is to verify the bills. Is all of the components present in the version that they gave me a software? Okay. That's the whole purpose. It's typically done in the test phase by the testing team. Okay, so whenever you get a new version, first thing you do is send it to testing. If that passed, then you do it. Okay, now let me take it one more step further. Make sure all the components are working, which is probably through login, you validate that all the database and everything is working. Then you can say, okay, now that I'm done with sending it to testing and smoke testing, I'm ready to do the regression testing or system testing or whatever work I was doing with that, with the new version of software. So that means the smoke testing is the other component is working with that new code. Everything as a system working 
in the code that you just gave me. Remember, when they give you, depending on how the system is architected, I'll, they'll give you, here is the whole system for the new version. Or they'll give you, here is the new piece. Maybe a presentation layer or maybe a data layer of the new piece. Then you need to make sure is that all the pieces are up and running so that I can continue with the testing. Okay. So it's always, if there are multiple components, does all of them are working and up and running for me to do the work, right? So database, my presentation to here, my business logic to here. So that's the smoke and sanity testing. Okay. Let's say bank of Africa, but the home page that should be in one day like that. It depends on what you do. I mean, that sanity testing. Sanity testing is just probably a matter of minutes. Yeah, so sanity testing is a matter of minutes. Smoke testing is also a matter of minutes. In fact, if you've done an automation, most of these tests are a matter of minutes. They're not like days. Like if you put the password and that will be like manual testing will take some time. Logging and password. Yeah. So to give you an example, right? I'm responsible um, as an architect and, and as a leader for a couple of systems within the JP Morgan that my team builds it. The entire when we go through a deployment, the entire end to end gets done in 10 minutes, which is building it pulling the code out from the code repository, building it, making sure, running all the static scan against all of the secure, known security vulnerability, running all the tests to make sure everything is working. Once it passed, migrates into the operational environment, run through automated check-in for our uh, change management software, deploys into production, does the sanity testing of the deployed environment in production. All thing is in less than 10 minutes over there. Into right, so depending on that, that's how that's how you can do it. Like it's when you think about likes of Amazon, likes of Microsoft when they releases on an hourly basis, you can't have a long, long running test time. It has to be automated. It has to be in the matter of minutes to do that. Now all of those automation, right? Everything starts with the manual system, right? When you build a system that somebody needs to be manually testing, or you go into a modern engineering way where you build the test first and then write the code. So again, what's more important is know the terms. I would not worry about yet how long it takes, right? As you experience those, you will figure it out how long it takes it, and then you will always start looking at it, so, okay, now it's taking this much time. What can we do it? The more experience you get it, the more faster way you do it. Okay. The next sets of testing terms that you know it is the functional testing. Remember in some of the test plan report, right? We talked about functional reports that focuses on that. So this testing is done at a little bit higher level than the system level. It's done at the functionality level. Does this function work as expected? Right. So one of the function is login. Right. Is the login works as expected? Right. It's probably going to go across multiple modules, but when you look at the implementation wise, there is a security function implemented, and that manages with the users, managing the dealer, all of that aspect. Right. So when you start thinking about a functionality says, is that particular feature works? For example, you go to the Amazon, right? One of the things you can do it is you can also look into it is what is the rating for this product by a customer who like it? That's a feature, that's a function. All you're testing is that function work is expected. Can I give that rating and can I view that rating? That's a functionality of that system, right? So can you user do this in the system? And that's what the answers try to do. It's in the testing phase done by the test team. Okay. So at, at this point, right, when you're looking into progression, right, from a unit testing to an integration testing to 
um, system testing, do sanity, uh, smoke testing, do all the regression, do functional testing. And at that point, you're going to say, this particular feature is working as expected. This system is working as expected for one user because you did all of the testing. The next set of question comes in, does the system work for 50 concurrent users or 100 concurrent, so whatever it was parameters that was defined. How are you going to do that? Right? So performance and load testing is what you try to do. The whole goal is, does the system perform the same way under the design load? So when you try to do that, that's what the load and performance test, right? It tests it, is the system responsive? under the stress, under the load as expected, okay? And it also talks about the stability, is the system runs as expected. So as I mentioned earlier, right, on a Black Friday, right, when you go in, the whole thing comes under all load performance testing. Another example, right? It doesn't matter what live event you talk about, right? NFL, Super Bowl, right? They stream it live, right? A million people logs in to watch that stream. Does it still give the same experience to that or it starts buffering, right? That's a load in performance testing. Is my stream can handle a million user without having any degradation. The moment it starts degrading it, that means system is not capable to handle any more load without reducing the capabilities or performance. It's typically done in the later stage of life cycle in the testing phase. And it's done by testing, but more often than not, you have a dedicated load and performance teams because it requires some scripting capability, scripting knowledge and skills. Also requires some programming because you are programmatically doing it. Because you can't have a million users sitting at the desk to run at the same time. You have to simulate it. Okay, any question on this? Okay, the next one is the stress testing. <clears throat> so load and performance testing tries to answer, does the system perform under the load, design load, and still be as responsive as expected? If I want to see it in a system at what point it breaks, okay? So how many users it can handle before the performance starts degrading it? That's called a stress testing. I'm putting the system under stress to see it at what point it breaks it, okay? The perfect example, remember I was talking about the Apollo 13, right? So those of you who watched the movie, can like it's a good movie, I'm science buff, so I like those kind of movies. But the most important thing is the whole story if you're not aware of it, is essentially back in 70s when NASA was sending humans to the moon, one of the mission was at Apollo 13. So this is after uh, there was already three successful landing on the moon. They were sending it uh, another crew to the moon, halfway through the moon, there was an explosion. Okay, so half of the system went offline. Now think about it, right? It's not something that, hey, I can stop, get out of the car, fix the car, get back in the car and continue driving, right? The situation is altogether completely different. And the whole big question they had it for uh, the person, uh, Gene, who was in the charge of the control for that particular mission, he was in the responsible mission control director, is to how to bring those three astronauts alive back to the Earth. The systems were crippled. There was no way it was going to land on the moon. And it's not something that you can send a reinforcement to get them out. Right? So you have to think about whatever is available to bring it back. Right? So they had to shut down all of the um, battery and all of the system, which is not required. So they kept it bare minimum system to run it. And they decided the only... the the most expedited way to bring back the astronaut is not to turn around and bring back them to Earth. It was to actually continue to fly to the moon and use this moon's gravity to accelerate and bring them back to the moon, right? So 
the whole point is um, they had somebody on the ground control then went into created that situation and run the stress testing at what point things will break. And they utilize that data to say, it's, okay, don't go over that thing. So as they applied all the experiments, they made sure that they did the stress testing before figuring out what are the failure points and whether they can shut those system down and then can restart those system safely or not. Okay, so that's the whole aspect of stress testing is figuring it out at what point the system breaks and what is the behavior when it breaks, okay? And, and again, those are rare workloads. Another perfect example of um, stress testing is 9-11, uh, right? So when the uh, terrorist attack happened on 9-11, all of the communication systems got way heavily overloaded. So typically most of the communication, most of the telephone or all the systems are designed that only certain percent of the capacity is gonna be utilized at any given point, right? So if there are, let's say a million telephone users that they have a device, at any given point, only 10% of them is gonna be utilizing the network because they're making a call or connected to the network, okay? So the whole system is designed to perform around 15 to 20% of the provision user base capability. That's how the uh, phone network works. That day, when that thing happened, pretty much everybody in the surrounding area tried to reach it to their loved ones right away. Right? The human reaction, right? Natural will happen. So the system spiked it and actually bring it down. We couldn't make it any calls go through it for almost two hours. Part of the reason I know is I worked in a telecom company at that time and we were looking through all of those live stats to figure it out how we can generate the capacity to let the people's calls go through it. Right? That's another example of stress testing. At what point it's gonna fail. Typically it's not gonna fail, right? How many instances happened in the last 50 years in the phone industry that I had to deal with that kind of problems? But when it happens, you need to understand it. What is the reliability? At what point it's going to fail it, so that you can be proactively ready with the alternate measure. This is typically very expensive test because it's a destructive test. You are bringing things down at this point, right? You're trying to look at it, what what stress level your system can handle. When you do those kind of testing, it's a stress testing, and it's typically done by the test team. Right? It's typically Similar skill as your load and performance testing. So beyond limits, beyond the assigned. Beyond the design limit. Remember, like it's in the requirements, you had it. Ten percent of the user is going to log in concurrently, right? So you're going to design it according to that specification. It says, hey, if there are uh, let's say a thousand users, ten percent of them is hundred users, right? So they're going to say, can hundred user log in as expected? That's your load and performance, great. But then you would say, okay, 100 people can get in. Can 150 get in? And still the system gives you the same response time. Can 200 now log in get at the same time? So as soon as I hit 250, well, I start seeing slow response rate. Now I know system cannot handle that. But then it's gonna be, it's at 300, system scroaches to the hall. Right? So nobody gets any response. That's a stress point. That's a breakdown. Okay. This one, typically it's done only based on a business criticality. There's a very few systems that I've encountered in the last 20 or 40 years that actually go through this stress testing. Most of them has to do with the life of the humans. Anything which is probably not dealing with the life of the humans is probably not going to go through this because it's a very expensive and very thorough testing that you need to do. Okay. So most of you as a software quality assurance, at least in the initial part of your career, are gonna go to the load and performance testing and probably gonna stop there. You very, very rarely you will do this. Okay. Any questions? All right. So now you have, a system working, you 
ran through load and performance, make sure everything is working. Then you give it to the user and it says, now it's ready for you to test it. And when the user gets involved and start doing that testing, now is the system ready to work the way it's expected? That's known as user acceptance testing. Okay. So the whole purpose of user acceptance testing is to answer, is system usable by the users? Does it work as expected for the users? Okay. And this is typically done during the acceptance phase. So remember like it's we have around this DLT lifecycle, I'm done with the my bug fixes and tracking and now go into the acceptance phase after testing. That's the phase then the thing happens. Typically, typically it is done by the end users, but quite often they also tell the testing team says, can you do this on my behalf? And they give them, here are all the different scenarios I want you to test it. You go and test it. Another important aspect is, since this is actually how people are using it, for most of the systems, this will be a manual testing. Because this is how, as a day-to-day -day user, I'll be using the system, right? So. There is a rare location where the UAT is also kind of automated, but most of the times it is going to be manual. Okay. And what type of it's going to be? Is it going to be a black box or a white box system? Yeah, right. so it will be a black box because users don't care how you implemented the system, what are the components. What are the boundaries? They don't care. All they yeah, care it is. Must be before. Yeah. Must be the... yeah. You're just caring if the phone works as expected or not. You don't care what operating system is and how it is implemented underneath the hood. Right? So that's the user acceptance testing. Some of the other terms that you will hear is back end testing. So typically, most of the systems that you interact will have some sort of user interface that user will interact with. But there are aspects of system that you need to test in it. Like for example, one of the requirements that we talked about that in the Powerflow is auditability requirement, right? So if you look into one of the non-functional requirement, it says that every transaction, every update that you make it should automatically capture it in the system, right? Typically, you're not going to see it if I'm logging in from the front end, whether it saved it or not, right? Mm -hmm. So you're probably going to log in into database, run some script to see if did it run it as expected. Did it capture all of the audit things as expected or not, right? When you do those kind of testing that you're accessing directly the backend components. So essentially anything but the presentation here that you access it to do any testing, it's essentially known as a backend testing. Okay. And it's, more often than not, it's done by the test team. Okay. So for example, like it's, if I'm doing an Amazon purchase, right? And I'm doing that ordering testing. Part of it is I need to make sure is the payment gateway working is expected or not, because it's an external service. I'll write a script, which essentially automatically creates that data, calls that service, gets back the response. That's known as a backend test. The next aspect is the web application testing. So you talk about all those different types of testing. When you go into the world of web and mobile, right? There are other things that you need to think about and consider. Uh, I would say is that probably good 80 or 90% of new applications are built today is either web or mobile. That's the only reality. Like most of the things is in the internet and that's where you log in and do all of your work, okay? Most of the applications are getting to a point where it's deployed on the cloud. Um, so when you look at the web application, in addition to your traditional functional testing and other aspects, there are other things that you need to think about. <coughs> And one of them is usability testing, okay? So the company that does a very good job with the usability testing 
in the designing is Apple. Okay. You give your iPhone or iPad to a one-year-old or a two-year-old. Uh, they can still use it. It's a user-friendly, right? So the aspects that you need to test it as a tester or quality assurance person when a web application is deployed, is this usable? Can the user find what they're trying to find it easily in your application, right? So it's a friendliness of the application is what the testing that you do it, right? A lot of times you do it as, hey, mm -hmm. is everything accessible in the olden days? And the reason I'm saying is olden days because things has progressed since then. One of the thumb rules that people will do it whenever you build a web application is any functionality, can I access it within three clicks? Anything more than three clicks required is probably not a user friendly. But since then, things Apple has changed the definition of how people go about it. It's no, no longer about three clicks. It's about the friendly piece. Okay. Functional testing, exact same as your traditional application testing. Is the function and feature and capability of system works as expected. Then you will also have a compatibility testing. So in the olden days, prior to the proliferation of the web, right? People will build an application and they know exactly on what environment it will be on. Right? Because I will have my own company's computer, everything will run within company network only. So I already know what kind of hardware, what kind of software people are running it because it's all my company stuff. As you build a web application, you don't know where they will be running. You don't know whether they have an Apple device or they have an Android device to work with it. They don't know whether they have Windows platform or Linux platform for what they're logging and looking into it. Specifically, they don't know what version of browser they will be using, right? My favorite version may be one than yours, right? Somebody on the Apple is most likely use Safari. Some people will use Chrome, right? Some of us, Windows world will use Microsoft, I'm sorry, Microsoft Edge now. Right, Internet Explorer is retired. So you need to think about the different version of software they will be doing. And within that, there may somebody may be running a Chrome version one. Somebody else might be running Chrome version five. Right? Is this separate uh, testing for like uh, mm -hmm. uh, desktop and separate for mobiles? Because so, so, yeah. Yes, you need to make sure everything works as expected, right? Yeah. So that's where they think about, they talk about the compatibility testing. So if I'm running an application on a MacBook under Safari, does it work exact same way? If the application is running under the Windows platform under Internet Edge, right? Because it's a web application. I don't know what users will be using. Right? So there is always bound that we need to make sure is the application works as expected in different browsers. That's called compatibility testing. Typically, your user requirement will talk about what are the expected operating environments are. So they say, hey, it should work in Edge, Chrome, and Internet Supply. As long as it works on those three, that's what you need to test on it. Now, there are tons of browser outside, right? You cannot possibly, in a reasonable time and a reasonable expenses, test everything across all the available platform across the world. You cannot. Therefore, you need to figure it out. What is the scope? And does the application work across and behaves the same way? Right. So one of the areas where people fail at when they build the application to think about it is when you're utilizing your touchscreen devices, there is no right click. Right click is only when you're using a you know, Windows platform or application or computer, personal computing device. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times when things fail it, they said, yeah, application is accessible from the web and mobile both, mm -hmm. but you can do a right click on that. And if you implement a functionality, which is a right click, you need to provide an alternate way. Otherwise it's not going to be compatible. <laughs> right. So that's an example of what tester will test. It. The other aspect you do it is database testing, right? So we talked about the backend testing, logging into directly into the database making sure every update that you made it from the front end 
that actually reflects it. If there is a uh, things needs to be automatically tracked and audited, it is audited as expected. Another aspect is a security. Okay. Should be very familiar. All of you like to get tons of patches from Apple, right? Every so often security patch for the OS and that. All that talks about it, it's not just the security from the point of view, can I log in or not, right? But when I'm sending the data, is my data encrypted and secure or not, right? Going over what is known as a secure socket layer communication or SSL communication. Because you can't send a um, social security number and a credit card number in an encrypted way. What if somebody's tapping into your connection and get all of that, right? So that's what's called security testing, is all the data at rest and at the motion are they secured and encrypted. That's the testing that you do it. And the last one is a performance testing. When I'm performing at certain things, certain tasks, is it giving me the reasonable response time as defined in these specifications? Because it goes on the internet, right? So a lot of times you don't have control of the end to end, but you need to do testing to say, it's, do I know what is the average time it takes it or not and what it takes it in my system component? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Are you good? Do you understand all the terms? I'm not asking you to memorize, but do you understand what each one of them means? All right. And it becomes much more easier once you start applying it. Hey, I did this type of testing versus that type of testing. All right. The area where I would focus as a quality assurance is the type of testing which is done in the test environment or during the testing phase, because that will be your primary focus will be. Very rarely, you will do a unit testing or an integration testing with the link testing. Okay. Any questions? All right. I'm going to skip this exercise for now because this is what we're going to start doing it starting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We'll start. What I want to talk about for today before we call it a day is the defect management. Okay. So one of the aspects we talked about is when I start doing a any sort of testing, whether it's a static or dynamic testing, there are things that I'm gonna find which doesn't conform to the product specification, right? Whether it's in a requirements document or whether it's when I actually execute the system, right? That means whenever that happens, I'm gonna open a defect. Well, what is the life cycle? What is the management process around that defect? That's what we're going to talk about it. Okay. So essentially, understand what is it and how we manage and track it. Okay. So a defect is essentially an error in the system. Okay. There are two characteristics of it. One is it produces unintended results. Okay. And then deviates from an expected behavior. It's a fault in the system. And it's also the same thing as you will know in the software world is a bug. Right? People started using the word defect in a broader sense because when you are doing a static analysis or static testing, you are not actually running the software. You're just doing analysis, right? So defect is a broader word than the bug. Does everybody know the history about why it's called a software bug? Okay. So in the olden days, when there was a development was happening, they were doing it in a big personal computing devices, which was a pre-generation from a desktop, and doing it, right? And some of the times they were testing it and things were short-circuited. So they were not getting the expected results. So they actually opened the chesses and looked into what is happening. There was a bug which was crawling on top of your uh, logic board, which was shorting the two connections. And that was producing it. That's how the software bug term came in. 
Okay. So essentially, it's a variance from a desired product behavior or product attribute. Now, the only things you want to be careful is incomplete requirements doesn't mean bug. Okay. So if somebody didn't give you your requirements, and that's why the software was not performing that capability or function, it's not a bug, okay? That's a lack of requirements. It's not even a 3CNT. If somebody didn't give you a whole piece of reporting requirements and then expect that system to do the reporting, that's not a bug. That's a lack of requirements. That's a new feature that they're looking for. So just keep that thing in their mind. So here is the typical life cycle for a defect, just like what we did the software development life cycle. All the bugs also go through the life cycle. And typically it starts when you as a tester or quality assurance person finds a problem which doesn't conform to <laughs> the expected behavior. Okay. When you find it, you essentially open it. So the defect gets started at the open stage. Once it's opened, it gets assigned to somebody to look into it. And typically, all, most of the companies have a process in place which says, hey, if this kind of bug is found, it gets assigned to this, right? So there is a groups that gets assignment depending on that. If you're working on a specific application and you find the bug, it typically goes to a group of developer which are responsible to build that system, okay? So depending on the bug, what it is, it gets assigned to somebody to look into it and say, hey, somebody needs to do an analysis to understand what this bug is, and is it truly a bug or is it something which is a, something else, right? So they do an analysis at that point, is this an, an issue, right? So that bug gets assigned to somebody to look into it, the defect gets assigned. They do an analysis and they either come to one of the two conclusions. Yes, I agree that this is a problem. It's a defect that we need to fix it. Or no, it's not a defect. So if it's not a defect, they reject it. Says, this is not a defect. It's that you didn't set your environment right, set it this way and it will work as expected. Okay, so that's one aspect. If they do determine it is an issue. Then they get it to the developer, who then like it works to change the software and fix that bug. Okay. Once they fix it, they set the status saying, okay, now it's ready for you to verify. So I'll give you a version which has this issue fixed. You go test it. So when they give you a new version, they will set the flag that it's ready to be verified. And you as a developer look at it, what all is ready to be verified? I'll pick it up and I'll continue testing with that. When you test it, the first thing you look at it is, is it fix the issue? Okay. If it does, then you close it. If not, then you said, wait a minute, you said it's fixed, but it's not. Here is the problem, right? So you give them that update open it and then goes back through the cycle of assigning it again and fixing it. Then do the whole cycle. Again. It's a whole cycle goes again. So when is it rejected? So typically it's rejected as let's say when you say it's, hey, I try to give this URL and it's not working. It's not pulling up the application, right? They may just say, hey, you know what? You have a wrong URL. Here is a correct URL. So they will reject the bug. It's not a problem with the software. It's a problem with your human communication. They will go give you, here's the new URL, go try it. They look at it and say, oh yeah, it's working. So they will reject the software in the tracking system, the bug, that, hey, this is not an issue. It's a human error. So when uh, it will be closed and verified, then we have to write some report or It will automatically report. Most of the uh, bugs nowadays utilize this into software systems that you use it to build a software ecosystem what's known as application lifecycle management tools. And we'll, we'll use those tools as we go through it. Okay, and typically the reports are generated by using the data from this at multiple stages, right? How many bugs, are, new bugs are open versus how many are verified, how many are in the process of working and so on. 
So all those reports that we talked about comes from the data behind the system. Okay. So that's a defect life cycle. Okay. And you usually put a process around management, managing those defects. Okay. And again, your goal is first to prevent any defects from happening. Because remember, any rework is expensive than no work. Right? If I don't have to do the work and I got it everything right the first time, that's my goal. Right? The defect gets introduced in the system when I cannot get the things done right the first time. Right? That's the whole bottom line at that point. Right? So your goal is to prevent the defect whenever it's possible with full realization that it's not always possible to prevent all the defects. So if the defect is introduced somewhere in the system, your goal is to find as early as possible, right? So as part of defect management, either you prevent all the defects or if it is introduced, find as early as possible. And then once you find it, then you need to minimize the impact of it. So what steps you can take it to, in order to minimize the impact? That's the whole defect management process, okay? And the defects gets costly as you go through the life cycle. So here is the data. That was a whole from a study that was compiled in uh, late 90s, early 2000s from a whole bunch of systems across the world, okay? So if you find a defect, while well, you're still in the requirements analysis phase. Let's say it cost you $1, okay? If you let that defect go into the design, probably it costs just double because I have to go rework some of the design and some of the requirement analysis work. If you let it seep it through the requirements and design phase, and the first time you identify the defect is when you're coding, it's a, hmm, you didn't talk about this condition. I'm writing the code, but there is a gap here, right? At that point, you may have to take a look at the design again. You may have to like to go back and redo some of the work. So the cost is about five folds than the requirement. So if it will cost you $1 to fix in the requirement phase, same defect if it got undetected and detected only at the code phase, will cost you about $5. If it passes the code, gets into the test phase, right? So it's kind of, you're running the test and then you're identifying that, right? The same defect will cost you now $10 to fix it because why? Because you identify the defect, give it back to the developer, developer has to stop whatever they're doing it, they have to fix that, right? And they have to give you back. You're gonna do the regression testing for everything that you've tested so far and retest the bug, right? So there's a lot more effort now involved in order to do that same thing that could have cost you only $1 to fix when the requirement was there. Got it? Mm -hmm. So that's what's $10. If it gets out from the test environment into the production, it's typically $100. Okay, so if you are trying to manage your defect, you should make sure that in it moved it as left as possible because the cost as you move it to the left is a lot less. The reason why it's so high in the crowd environment, because now you're not only just dealing with fixing the software, you're dealing with the fallout of the software. Maybe data got corrupted, maybe you lost some customers. Right? So there are a lot of other aspects comes into play if the software defect goes up into the production environment. Any questions? It's good. Understand why you need to fix it as early as possible. So this is typical process. Okay? In most of the organization, you have some sort of a defect prevention mechanism in place. You baseline that version. And as the project progresses it, you understand it is, if you found the defect, why did you find it? Why did the defect made it from one phase to another phase? 
You do some analysis of that. You figure out how we're going to resolve that defect. Right? How are we going to prevent them happening from again? So what changes are you going to make in the process? And then goes back to the baseline. All right. So for example, if you're seeing a lot of defects, let's say uh, as soon as it goes in test environment, right? One of the potential way you can do it is, hey, somebody needs to look at the code twice. So let's put a peer review or static analysis in place. And then let's make sure we have all of the tests executed and we have a check in place that all tests gets executed before it gets into the test and one, right? So that's nothing but a process improvement. Then you apply that, look it for the next projects or next sets of activities to say, did it work? Did it reduce my errors? If yes, then it's good. Then this process improvement work. If not, what changes I need to do it in top of that? Okay. And then there is a reporting happening all along that enables you to get the data. Hey, how many defects were found? What process I used it? How many defects were fixed and so on? Okay. So it's a process for tracking software. Most of the times, you don't have a soft, you don't need a sophisticated system to track that, right? You can do a simple, hey, I can do an Excel and then keep track of all of that. Typically, nowadays, most of the software is done development in what is known as application lifecycle management type tools, right? So one of the ones we'll look at is Azure DevOps or Jira, where it enables you to track all of that. So you identify flag and there is a built-in capabilities and functionalities on those systems. Okay. I have a question. Uh -huh. So like in the auto industry, when they produce most of these uh, electric car vehicles, mm -hmm. and we need all the test productions and all that, and we decided to send it out to the end users. The vehicles are out there in the public for some period of time, six months, one year, before they begin to see some of the defects in these vehicles. So. Who is responsible for the defects that do occur after the vehicles are going into the public for some years? I would, I would not focus as much as who is responsible, right? Remember, like it's a lot of times, it depends on the severity. Even the CEOs has lost their jobs for recalls, right? Because those are nothing but recalls of your vehicles, right? So, Typically, when those kind of things happen, where you end up doing a recalls, the first thing you look into it is what caused that defect to seep into production, why it was not caught in earlier. So you look into the process improvement, you look into the management data, all things that was done in order to release that particular version of the software that essentially eventually called a recall. And then you identify what steps you're going to take it and how are we going to fix it, right? And then you have to do at that point two levels, right? One is you have to worry about minimizing the impact, right? Because you don't want the software out there, people using it and impacting their lives, right? That's why a lot of things gets, hey, go ahead and get it fixed right away. Some may not be as critical and they says, hey, get it fixed in the next six months, right? You go to the dealer shop and then they will fix it for you. So different mitigation strategy comes in. But it's not as much as who is responsible, but they look at it as what was the failure point in the process that caused that defect to seep out into production environment and what we can do it to eliminate it. So that's typically the process that pretty much everybody is used. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, so let's talk about when you create defect, what kind of data that typically people use it and capture, right? So obviously, if it is kind of automated tools, a lot of times it's an ID that you use it. Hey, this is a specific ID because you want to identify how many defects, whether it's unique or not, right? But the key aspects for the human's point of view, it's essentially, what is the description of defect? What actually it is and what type of defect it is? It also capture what is the source of the defect. Where did you find it? When did you find it? What is the development phase? Then you also talk about the severity and the priority. Remember what we talked about? How impactful it is? 
is it critical or is it just a cost mechanism? And the priority is essentially, do I have to fix it now, right away? Or can it wait? Or it's okay if I don't fix it, it can still live with that. Okay, again, what are the different statuses out there? Um, some additional information that they tracked it in defect that is usually useful for the analysis of those defects is essentially when did the first time it's reported, date and time. Also tr track it, when was its last change, right? So remember we said it goes through the various steps. So what is the step, when it changed, what component was found into it. Also, the most useful thing is what are the activities I was doing it that caused me to uncover that error, whether it's test case, what steps, what are the preconditions that I set it up that essentially enable me to find this effect so that somebody in the development side, when they get that, can they reproduce it? They will try to set up the same condition, same environment, and then rerun it to produce the error in the development environment to see what causes it, right? So it helps it in a lot of troubleshooting. Then it's essentially uh, who is working on it, or responsible to fix it in the system. The priority we talked about, right? High, medium, low, right? High is I need to address this first versus low is I, I can take it at a later point, right? And I hear some of the examples of those type of things, but as you go through it, you will realize that, hey, can I do my work without this or that? To me, that's the simplest priority. Right? Most of them results into those critical items that needs to be fixed right away, right? So when you do a recall on an auto, right? You find a defect. There could be a defects that may cause accidents, right? You want to address those first versus the defect that may, hey, it may not be, it's a cosmetic thing that this strip comes out easily. So you go back and they will replace you new with the new process and the new type of things. Then it also, defect management helps you to generate some of the reports, right? Some of things is how many defects I'm finding it on a daily basis. Hey, here are the new defects I found it yesterday. Here are the types of essentially the defects that I found it, right? So it is distributed. It's in a security component or it's in a dealership component or it's in a credit application creation component. Right, so it gives you a distribution. Part of it is to understand that what are the weak points in the system that they need to be addressed, in. and how many you found it versus how many it fixed it. Right, so essentially, is your net defect count is going up or down? That's essentially a trend. Okay, and here is the sample example. Okay, because of the lack of space, I didn't put all of that, but it gives you an idea, right? So here's first effect is in database area. It's a low uh, severity. It's not as impactful, right? Its priority is you, we want you to fix it, but not before the hire. It's a medium, right? There are the dates it's created. Here's some description about what that defect is about, right? Same way for the other two. The last thing that you do right, is once you identify the defect, is understand the impact of the defect, right? So it's obviously, right, so if it's out in the production environment where you found the defect, obviously your impact is big, right? And you need to think about it. Hey, what all I can do it to minimize the impact, right? And one of the ways you can do it is, it's gonna generate a bad uh, press, right? So I need to think about being proactive in PR, notifying the customer, hey, you are impacted be aware of it so that I can minimize it. I can advise them, don't use the car for uh, till you go get to the dealership and get fixed or put a hold of do this or do this activity type of thing. If are the defects that are like found it during my testing phase, right? Now there is an impact because I'm giving it to the development team. They have to tell me how long it's gonna take it, right? As one of the example we talked about, hey, it's gonna take you three months to fix it. Well, what does it impact the timeline? If this was a critical that I need to fix it, high priority, that means I can't release it, the software in production without fixing this. Well, what does it mean to me? 
now because I was supposed to release the software version in two months. I can't, what is the mitigation, right? It also requires me to now hold on to my testing resources for a little bit longer than what I was anticipating originally. What if they are not available? And what is the impact? Or if they are scheduled to work on testing something else, now is that an impact on that project? So there's a whole bunch of impact analysis you do it, and then you identify what is the best course of action to address that risk. Okay. So that's all about the defect. Any questions? This is what we're talk about. Like, suppose, like, I'm deciding, like, I'm saying, like, this is a high priority defect or, like, well, some kind of critical thing. But, like, developer, as, as per developer, this is, like, low priority or medium. So who decides so, the priority? Typically, there are guidelines in corporation which are used to assign the defect level. So it's not a random, it's not, hey, I feel it is important. So it's not the feeling factor. It's some hard concrete number. It is essentially, is it impacting functionalities? How many users it's impacting? What is the bottom line impact on the dollar amount? Based on that, it's kind of defined criticality, right? So there is a, some, some- That is always- thing. Yeah. Like e even in the real world, when you go out into production, right? And there are some defect are done, but it's always multiple levels. So there, there are levels that if a defect is identifying at that level, then the people are getting engaged at very high level that does it. I, I've worked on the firmware platforms where a certain level of defects, essentially I'm sitting in front of CFO, giving update every two hours, what we are doing it to address it and getting back to the normal state. Right. So because that is an attention, there is like things happen at that state. Because in some cases, that is a life and death situations that could impact people's lives. So, so it, it's not an arbitrary whoever decides it. It's essentially based on criteria that the companies have defined it. Hey, when I find a defect, if it is this level and this activity and it's an impact on this, that's what it does. Then, right? So if you're a banking application, right? and people can access the bank, right? That's a problem, right? Because people's life are dependent on the ability to withdraw the money from the bank. And so we may not think it, hey, it's okay, it's not available, I'll do that. But there are literally people's life are dependent on those. So those things, right? If it's impacted 100 customers, probably it's not something that I have to drop everything and look into it right away. But if it's impacted 10,000, 20,000 customers, guess what? People are dropping everything that they're doing and focusing on making sure it's back up so that people can access the money. Right? So those kind of criteria are defined not loosely. For me, think about it. If I'm a single user, I can access the bank. It's critical to me. It may not be critical in the biggest span, right? So as a company, I have to decide what criteria you use it, where to deploy the resources. And most of the companies will have guidelines. Anything else? All right. Any questions online? Uh, no, sir. All right. Here is what we're going to do. Okay. It's a good time. I, I don't think I want to start a new topic with only 15 minutes left. So let's talk about homework, okay? So you have third document with your test plan document. Remember the folder up there? And for the physical folders, that's the third document in that tab. After your requirements and the line specification document, read that document. Yeah. Read that document, understand it, Right. Again, I'm not expecting you to do any analysis, but right? just understand. We talked about test plan, right? Most likely, if you go in a big company, you will not be building it. But if you're going in a small company, this is something you want to be aware of what kind of information goes into it. Okay. You are talking about the oh, that testing last Yeah, there's a test plan document. Right after the uh, design specification document, 
that we talked last week. Okay. Okay. Did everybody find it? Yes. Okay. So that's the document that you want to read. It. Another thing, I would like you guys to read it. If you have. Sorry. Um. Before you. Um. Can you. Uh, the document you wanted us to read. Uh. Where am I supposed to go? I didn't find mine. So. Do you remember where you found the requirements document and the uh, design document? Yes, design document. It's in the same folder. There is a third document called the test plan document. <coughs> okay. So that's the document that I want you guys to read it. So go to the same directory, same location where you found the requirements document and the design document. In that folder, there's another PDF called test plan documents. And for the people who are in the room, you have a physical copy of that document, okay? Second thing I would like you guys to do it is if you have not finished reading the requirements and design document one more time after we discussed on Thursday, finish reading it, okay? Before tomorrow morning. <laughs> so then we should talk through those questions on that, right? So I'm done with talking to four hour lectures. <laughs> So tomorrow, I'm going to start with the actual deliverables of building something. And then you all are going to have an opportunity to build that thing because Harshal and I are like a lot more. Unless you practice it, you're not going to know what you're going to know. Right? So you're going to do it. So bring your pen and papers tomorrow. You are more than welcome to bring your laptops because at some point, whatever you write on pen and paper tomorrow, you have to convert it into the system. So. If you're like me, I don't want to like to do it too many works and writing detail. I would rather put it directly in computer, bring your computer. As long as you have some sort of a word or some sort of word processing document, like it's, whether it's Google Open Word or that, you should be fine. You don't need us any special software. Okay. So bring it that. We'll start with pen and paper because that's the most effective way to put your thoughts on. It. We'll start with that. We'll look through writing the test cases tomorrow. Okay. So any questions that you have it on the requirements document as you go through it, let's flag and let's talk through it tomorrow. Okay. I have a general question. Uh -huh. So um, for the testing and all that, is there like a universal uh, software that we have to learn? Or is there like a uh, each company uses a certain uh, techniques or software. That so there, to... are, there are a group of softwares available. Uh, it, it all depends on a company to company. Mm -hmm. What we are going to first initially focus on is the process that you need to understand it in order to build those artifacts. And then we'll also go through a couple of those software tools. Okay. But once you understand the process, then we'll also tell you and teach you how to use those tools. Okay. But again, we can't cover every possible tool. Right, right. But the key aspect is if you know the process, picking up a tool is not a big deal. Right. As far as understand the basics. Yeah. Precisely. So that's the approach we're going to use it. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Any questions? If not, you get to go out 15 minutes early today. But we have to finish reading the class. Well, read it sometime before Thursday. Okay. Don't have to finish reading it, but that's your homework for today, is to read the test plan document. Okay. But make sure you finish reading the requirements and spec document before tomorrow morning, because we're going to start using those documents tomorrow. You can wait test plan till Thursday. Okay. If you're not writing it, it's more of your knowledge. Read through it. 
if you have any questions, because some of you may end up writing it if you work in a small one. Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend it. It's, it's not it's not as complex as the other two. Let me put that. One. Okay. All right. Uh, online, if you have any questions. If not, we can call it a day. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um.